All right, good evening and welcome to the March 1st meeting of the uh, Arlington Redevelopment Board. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the redevelopment board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, ident identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other people may be able to see you and take care not to screen share your computer. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. Before we jump into the first item on the agenda, I will take a roll call uh, to confirm that all of the members of the redevelopment board are here. We'll start with uh, Kin Lau. I'm here. Great, thanks, Ken. Uh, David Watson. Present. Jean Benson. Present. And uh, Melissa Tintacalis. Present. And Melissa, did I say your last name correctly? Uh, yes, Tintacalis. Tintacalis, thank you very much. And I just want to, before we get started with our first agenda item, welcome Melissa to the Redevelopment Board. This is her first uh, meeting with us and we're thrilled to have you join us to bring your uh, expertise in economic development and land use development and planning initiatives to the board. So I don't know if you have anything that you would like to say before we get started. Um, no, thank you. It's um, an honor to be, you know, kind of part of the board and I'm excited to kind of contribute kind of my expertise um, to the town and um, I look forward to kind of getting to know you guys as a board um, and then kind of getting a better pulse of kind of the community as we go through this, um, through the different projects, so. Great, thank you so much. We're, we're so pleased to have you with us this evening. All right, um, Jenny, any other announcements? Otherwise I'll jump into public hearings. No other announcements. Okay, great, no, thank, thank you. you. All right, so the first item on our agenda this evening is uh, the uh, opening of docket number 3647, 10 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, Jenny, I will ask before we turn this over to the petitioner, if you uh, or any uh, representative from the uh, planning department have any anything that you'd like to say. I don't have anything to say about this particular project that I haven't already prepared in the memo that was provided to the board. I think um, we can jump back to any additional staff comments after we hear from the applicant <laughs> and ask the board questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. And so who do we have with us um, from uh, the, the applicant who would like to speak this evening? Yes, you have the attorney for the applicant, Robert Anessi. You also have the uh, architect, Will Chalon. You also have Colin Beatty, one of the principals. You have Jim McIntyre, one of the other principals. And we also have Joe Walker, I believe, who is the going to be the contractor for the construction. Mm -hmm. uh, Fantastic. Uh, so Mr. Anessi, I'll just remind you, uh, if you could try and keep your remarks to around uh, five minutes. Um, we, you have a very, very thorough package, which I, I very much appreciate. I know that the other members of the board probably appreciate as well. I'm going to make a very short opening statement Thank and you. turn it over to Will, so Will can talk about the architectural aspects, which is more important than I think uh, what I'm going to have to say. I Thank think uh, most of you on the board are familiar with the site. Uh, the site is a blighted site. It was an automotive garage for many, many years. And the matter came before the ARB about a year ago. And it came before the board, maybe uh, longer than a year ago, uh, with respect to uh, the possibility of 21 residential units going at the site, in at the site. This proposal is totally different. We're talking about five condominiums 
we're talking about uh, utilizing the uh, existing garage at the site, constructing a new building to house the five condominium units. Uh, the garage would be used uh, in conjunction with Column Health uh, and uh, the condo units uh, would be probably used by employees of Column Health as well. Uh, the garage space would uh, consist of 8,000 square feet and would be used for meetings uh, from time to time, for office use from time to time, for column health, and, and for storage. And Will will tell you uh, there'll be a greenhouse on the top of the garage. The uh, five residential units uh, will be uh, 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 in, encased in a five-story building uh, surrounded by commercial properties in, in some close proximity to residential, but we believe that uh, we have enough uh, information for the board to conclude that there'll be no adverse impact on the abutting uh, residential uh, 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 properties with respect to what we're proposing. Uh, we do believe that if the, this proposal is approved by the board, it's going to transform that blighted area into an area that's going to be much more compatible with other uses in the neighborhood and uh, perhaps be much more beneficial for the neighborhood. With that having been said, Will, I would like you to jump in and tell us what this is all about. Sure, thank you very much, Bob. Uh, my name again is Will Chalfont from Calsa Design. Uh, we're an architecture firm located in Somerville. And I'm not sure who's controlling the screen, but if you could just scroll back up two pages. Jenny, Jenny is controlling the oh, screen. Sorry, <laughs> thank you, Jenny. Yeah, right there, that'd be a good place to start. So this is uh, an illustrative site plan, just quickly outlining um, the project. To the left-hand side is the existing garage. Um, we have sort of a connecting bridge there in red that goes from uh, left to right. And this is our new residential component on the right-hand side. Uh, this is really kind of an interesting project because it's both an adaptive reuse as well as a new construction. As Bob mentioned, you know, this is a sort of industrial zone, this part of uh, Sunnyside. Uh, not a lot of street activation, um, limited landscape, etc. So this is intended to sort of revitalize and activate this, this streetscape a little bit. Um, so in the center of this project is a driveway. We're utilizing the existing curb cut, uh, really the whole lot is actually one giant curb cut. I'll get into that in a moment. Um, but we're planning on utilizing the center of the site here to access. And uh, there'll be parking at the rear of the building. There's some tandem spaces in the back right. Thank you. And then there's uh, more vehicle. There are 18 other spaces within the garage where we're utilizing car stackers. So, um, you know, when I first uh, got involved in this project, uh, I spoke to Colin and Jim, and uh, I wish all clients were this interested in doing a very unique project. Uh, they really had a lot of great ideas, and uh, they threw them at me fast and quickly, but I think we've got all of them. And uh, I think it's a very unique project, not only for Arlington, but for um, the greater Boston area in general. So, um, as I mentioned, uh, it's an existing auto body with this vacant lot. Uh, our intention is to utilize the existing garage as much as possible. There are some sort of additions over the years on the rear part, portion of the building that we are removing. Um, but in general, we're keeping the footprint as is and we are eliminating a lot of the impervious material on the site, whether it's gravel or asphalt. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. I uh, can keep going, sorry, next slide. So here's just an overview quickly of the residential portion. Um, on the top right is the garage. Uh, actually, you know, these are the area plans. I apologize. If you just keep going, we'll get to sort of the nitty gritty. And um, okay, here we go. Perfect. So this is the ground floor level of the residential building, uh, Sunnyside Avenue to your right hand side. Uh, the intention is for this building to be uh, uh, staffed by a, uh, a concierge of sorts. And, and that's important only because. We've got these car stackers, which can be um, somewhat finicky in nature and as far as how, how they're uh, utilized, if you're not familiar with them. And that's why we have this attendant. This attendant will be not only a concierge, but a valet, which will uh, get cars in and out of these stackers and brought, brought to the um, door for the tenants and uh, members of Column Health adjacent. Uh, so in our entry lobby, we've got a, a bike room, 
as well as some uh, common bike racks out front. Uh, elevator, this building's fully sprinklered, but will have be serviced by two stairs and an elevator. We've got a trash room to the south. And um, as we continue further down on the page, we can see the, the drive aisle separating the, the office and residential. Uh, next slide, please. So um, these are, as, as Bob mentioned, five units. Um, they're all really all quite large in size. These are intended for the uh, column health leadership team. I believe um, already four of the, three or four of the units have been spoken for. Um, uh, must be an interesting corporate board meeting discussing who gets what, but uh, these are all large units with extensive outdoor space. Um, that's very important uh, for the client here is to, to have these outdoor um, areas for each unit. We've, we've got nearly almost 6,000 square feet of outdoor space between the four floors of the building. Um, keep, you can keep going to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so that second floor is comprised of two units and then the third floor has uh, three units, two of which are duplex units with the top floor. If we keep, if we scroll on to the next uh, slide, we can see those units. Um, and these units are for Jim and Bob that are on the call here. Uh, so we'll, we'll keep moving along there so nobody knows where they sleep. Uh, and then on here, we've got the common roof. Uh, these are, these are rooftops for the penthouse units. Uh, expen expansive space, uh, we're, we're showing a lap pool for each, um, as well as some outdoor workout area and outdoor kitchens. Uh, Jim, and, Jim and Colin really like to entertain. Uh, but it, another important amenity here is, is a lot of the green space and the, and the use of uh, green roof. We're intending to have um, sedum um, along with some other options once we get into the, the details uh, to help with the um, energy consumption of the building. Uh, this building is really going to be a uh, energy efficient building. It's going to be certifiable for lead gold. Um, we're utilizing geothermal on site as well as a, a large solar array, which is intended to um, run a lot of the you know common use space uh, within the two buildings. Uh, we're showing sun shades. We're utilizing solar heat gain as well as some uh, large overhangs for shade. Uh, there's a lot of recycled um, aspects to this between the existing garage and the, the use of a uh, shipping container that wants to be used as the bridge between these two buildings. So it's really kind of a unique space um, and project as a whole. So uh, I'm, I'm sorry to, to cut you off, but um, we, we are running um, a bit long. Uh, I'm the, sorry. The no, it's okay. There's a lot to go through here. So if you could just hit the high points, I'm sure that we'll get into a lot of the details too during the, the questions. That would be appreciated. Okay. Yep, I, I, I apologize for that. Yep, so, thank you. Uh, I have verbal diarrhea sometimes. So um, we've got a lot of lot going on here. Obviously, here's the greenhouse along with an outdoor space for employees to sit. We keep scrolling down. All of our uh, solar panels on the right hand side on the roof of the existing garage. You can keep scrolling. <clears throat> and these are uh, some elevations of the building, very nondescript. Uh, we'll get to the renderings shortly. Uh, that's probably actually, let's jump right to the renderings. So if we could keep going. Uh, keep going a little bit further. Uh, so here are some perspectives, um, black and white, just to start with. So on the, the top left image, you can see uh, the new greenhouse going on the roof of the existing garage. We've got the uh, shipping container sort of connecting the two buildings. And you can see these large terrace spaces and keep scrolling down. Thank you. Uh, just some inter interior vignettes. Uh, keep going. And here's here's some uh, these next few shots are more realistic versions uh, with the the existing context of Sunnyside. So um, again, here's the existing garage, the new building in the background. One of the things that we really want to sort of uh, emphasize here is the lack of pedestrian friendly access along the front of this site. So. We're proposing obviously to add a sidewalk here and um, some street trees to soften this, this portion of Sunnyside. We could keep going. So again, some views, this is from looking from the opposite direction, looking towards the Southern end of Sunnyside. Uh, the building is going to be a concrete and steel structure. We've got some pretty serious cantilevers here, which will require that construction. And our exterior material cladding is, is still somewhat up in the air only because material prices are fluctuating so much right now, but it's between 
either a um, insulated panel, something from like a Kingspan or possibly a Sembrit material, which is a composite material, excuse me, um, that's available in a lot of different colors and tones. So right now we're showing a sort of uh, a bluish gray uh, with masonry along the ground floor. Uh, keep, keep going. And again, these are sort of some, uh, again, perspectives, obviously without the context around them, but just to give you an idea of how the building uh, works in conjunction with the existing garage and uh, the streetscape. So with that, I uh, apologize for going on. Keep on to the questions. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, we will start, uh, we'll run through the, the, the roll call for the board uh, for questions for the applicant. And we will start with uh, Ken. Hi. Uh, thank you. It's a very, very nice uh, presentation you got here. A uh, very complete presentation. Um, I have a couple of quick questions. Um, the garage for in, in the new building where you park the cars, mm -hmm. is that an enclosed garage? Yes. Uh, how do you plan to ventilate that garage? So that's going to be mechanically ventilated um, with the vents for that will, depending on when we work with the RMMP engineer, will more likely be on the rear of the building. Um, certainly not out toward the street. So either in the side yard or the uh, rear, there will be an air exchange because we will absolutely have to ventilate that. So when you do that, um, you, you're close to zero a lot line almost. Well, in the rear, I've got close to 16 feet. So I've actually got a little bit of space back there. Um, on the right-hand side, adjacent to the existing oil company, I believe I'm closer to five. So uh, your point's well taken there. It, it is tight there, but uh, I, I don't foresee that being an issue. So you're gonna you're just gonna put movers there and just blow it out the side? It's not gonna go up to the roof? I'm not sure you can do that. Well, We've got two, I mean, for if we, we're not gonna be simply blowing it out, it would go through a filtration system. If we did need to go to the roof, we certainly have adequate space. As you can see, these units are large enough to accommodate a, a vertical shaft. Uh, so we could do that. Um, we, we haven't gotten to that level of detail yet, um, but it's a good point. Okay. Um, that was one issue. The other issue is um, on the top level, I know she did some uh, shadow studies and so forth like that. Is there uh, an aptitude to maybe uh, the head house there, make it a sort of uh, lighter and more, um, not as massive? Because when you look at the, your 3D models from the ground, those are pretty, um, you can see that fairly well. Uh, is there ways of maybe setting it back a little bit or changing the color or, or something so it doesn't look so tall. I mean, if you, you, you stress the major cornice on, on, uh, on that roof line there, and I think that should define the top of the building, but then I see these two massive towers behind it. It just makes it. Yeah. So um, I think from, from, the, from the elevator standpoint, I don't have a lot of options because of the overrun um, on the shaft, but I can certainly treat that with a different material that would allow it to sort of, to your point, fade into the sky a bit. Maybe that's um, you know, using a lighter color or something of that manner. The, the stair head house, um, I can look at relocating it maybe more towards the center of the building so that to your point, it's not as visible from the street. Um, it's, or you just angle it, I mean. Well, one of them is angled actually. The one along Sunnyside is angled. I'm not sure if you can see the top right or the either of the right images on this slide sort of shows it sloping down with the, the run, um, but we can we can look at, at at certainly you know moving those inbound a little bit. You can yeah you can see that image in the top right. That's the yep. slope. Um, um, it could come down probably another foot or so. Um, yeah, I'm just trying to minimize the stuff you got up top. That uh, you know the green up there is beautiful, but just these massive blocks up there doesn't. Um, yeah, it, it just puts the building taller and more out of scale than it really should be. Okay. We certainly look at that, look at ways of uh, removing those or relocating them. Um, my other question is your, um, you have two balconies on, uh, up on the second floor or third floor, fourth floor. 
Does that encroach upon the setbacks? Um, they would be, yes, but I believe that, well, this is the board to ask. I believe they were exempt from that, but if not, we can certainly pull them in, uh, remove them. Um, in my experience of, well, it, you know, it depends on the municipality. So if they're not allowed to encroach, um, we will pull them back. Jenny, did you take a look at that? We did look at that and we didn't note that as being an issue, but we can go back and check again. Okay. I just remember uh, having those on, on another project uh, where the balconies were the overhang, uh, right? Were hanging into the, uh, the side yard setback. At minimum, it we would on, need to provide uh, exterior sprinkler heads for those if they were uh, just based on proximity to the lot line. But um, depending on staff findings, we can revise that. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have for now. I mean, they all they all pretty technical questions. I mean, I, I love what you did here. It's an, it's a, it's a very handsome building. Thank you. And um, I think it's going to change the whole area there quite a bit. So I am. That's all I want to say for now. Thank you, Ken. David. Thanks, Rachel. Uh, it is a a really interesting project. Um, and uh, has a lot of has a lot of great ideas. Um, I have to ask, as an initial question, what is the purpose of the greenhouse? So uh, I would I really should defer to the owner on that because it was a request by them. But it's, it's my belief that they intend to grow a lot of the plants you see on this project in that greenhouse as well as food. Um, so it's it's truly self sustaining in that sense, but. Uh, I don't know if Colin is online, if he wants to chime in on why sure. he wants that. Colin, are you there? Yeah, I am. Uh, yeah. And, Jump in. and we've got different areas planned out in the greenhouse, uh, some fruit bearing trees, flowering uh, trees, um, uh, vegetables. Um, I have my eye on a, a very ornate, uh, substantial olive tree for the centerpiece there. It'll have seating areas, so it'll be a, an area for relaxation, an area that'll be warm and, and available and green for the wintertime, uh, which can be a little long. Um, so for us, it's um, you know, basically for my core team of, of seven or eight uh, executives, so just a, a place to go and, and something that can also generate some, some good food product. Okay, um, so uh, with respect to uh, seeking approval under the mixed use bylaw, did you explore whether this project um, uh, could be constructed without resorting to the mixed use bylaw? Yes, we did. And we think we have to use the mixed use bylaw. Uh, to construct the project. Uh, we took a careful look at the definition in the B4 zone uh, with respect to uh, uh, the intent on the part of the town to, uh, in fact, uh, get rid of automotive uses. We had too many in town uh, and uh, to convert automotive uses to uh, residential uses if we could. Uh, we thought that the mixed use bylaw would be the most appropriate way to do that. Uh, and as I've explained before, uh, it's my position uh, that the ARB has a much more leeway uh, under the mixed use bylaw than would otherwise be the case uh, with respect to granting relief for a particular project. And I, I premise that upon the argument that I've made previously, and I, I even did today in an email I've sent to the board on two warrant articles, 39 and 40, uh, with respect to sections 3.4.4, where the language uh, in the bylaw under environmental design review uh, talks about 
uh, the, uh, the ARV being creative, innovative, and, and the like, I think that uh, combined with the mixed use bylaw, I think is most appropriate with respect to what we're trying to do as far as the site is concerned. So yes, we did consider uh, whether we could go without using the mixed use bylaw, but I think we're more constrained in terms of what we'd be able to achieve if that were the case. Well, that, that's exactly the issue. Uh, I know it is. And yeah. uh, I, I think uh, if, uh, I, I guess my qu one question is, uh, do you have a plan B if we were to take the position that this is two structures and not within the uh, definition of mixed use? I, firstly, I, I don't think that you can conclude that it's two structures. If, if, you, if you're interpreting the bylaw uh, with respect to the language in the bylaw, the definition of a building attached in the bylaw is a building have any portion, a building having any portion of one or more walls in common with adjoining buildings. This building does have an adjoining wall in common with the, uh, with the other building. And I don't call it other building. I call it one building. I don't call it two buildings. Uh, and I think if you look at that definition in the bylaw, uh, let's talk about uh, literally reading the black letter in the by uh, bylaw. The black letter law in the bylaw is what I've just read to you. And that uh, to me indicates that uh, we're okay with that. That in fact, uh, the building is connected and it's connected appropriately with respect to the language in the bylaw as passed by town meeting. I, I hear what you're saying, Mr. Anessi. Uh, and I'm just letting you know that it is something that I am considering because I don't feel that it's as clear as you're making it out to be. Well, the language is clear. The language is clear, okay? I mean, I'm reading it and uh, you can read it as well. And if you can read it any differently than I've read it, I'd like to hear that. I'm gonna I'm gonna move on for the moment. Um, with respect to um, the upper stories, um, this building, as presented, does not uh, have uh, upper story setbacks, and I wanted you to talk about that a little bit. Um, so I, I believe zoning does not require that. Um, and the applicant really wanted to maximize their square footage for their units on there. Um, we try to sort of give some relief to that street with these, uh, cutouts for the, the balconies along Sunnyside, but, uh, this is the size units that the applicant wished. I, I would, I would contend that the zoning bylaw does require them and you would have to be granted relief by by us in order to not include upper story step backs. Okay, that wasn't brought to my attention by the city. So um, I will certainly- the town, It's a town, by the way, Will, not a city. Sorry, the, the town, apologize. All right. Um, with respect to the, the parking, um, I'm not really familiar with how the stackers work. I, I've got a general image in my mind of, of some mechanical, uh, some mechanism that lifts cars up to a, and then tucks another car underneath it. Is that how they work? Correct. Um, are, uh, with the three tandem spots in the back, were those included because they uh, were needed for a purpose, uh, for, for an operational purpose or merely to meet the uh, minimum requirements of the parking bylaws? Well, I believe we're, we, we have an excess of one spot. So really we only needed two in that instance, but the feeling, the feeling was that, uh, so your first part is to meet the requirement. The, uh, the second would be that the nature of the people parking here is such that it was felt that a tandem spot would work in this instance because they're literally working next to each other um, mm -hmm. and, and it wouldn't be a, uh, a burden to, to move. Uh, but it, it gave us a place in the rear to put them um, and allowed us to have, we, we previously had parking 
adjacent to the existing garage where we have a larger green space. We thought that that would really be a nicer um, item for the project as a whole, opposed to uh, putting more parking there. Okay. Um, I, I believe from um, the proposal that uh, the project does not meet um, the requirement for usable open space as presented. And so I was, I was uh, thinking about opportunities for creating more open space. And one thing that occurred uh, was uh, we, we are pretty amenable to uh, granting parking reductions in many cases, particularly uh, where there are uh, uh, other options for transportation uh, and, uh, and a high level of sustainability built into a project, which this already has. And as Mr. Inessi knows, uh, it, it probably would not be uh, much of a stretch to uh, bring some transportation demand management practices into a project that's already this sustainable. We could certainly do that, Mr. Watkins. All right. Uh, another thing I, you know, I understand um, the in, intention um, that, uh, that the company's leadership team uh, would be living in these units. Um, and, and they're certainly very, very nice units. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit torn uh, because you, you didn't refer to the earlier proposal for this site that would have brought uh, significantly more housing units in, into Arlington. And um, these units are certainly uh, far larger and far less affordable than the, than the units that um, in general, we would prefer to, to see uh, uh, being constructed in Arlington at this point. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm considering that, um, but I... David, I'm, I'm sorry. I know we have a hard stop at eight. Do you, do you have any more specific questions for the, the applicants? So the um, no, those were the major issues that I, I wanted to raise. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank I'll, you very much. On. Great. Thank you. Uh, Jean. Thank you. Um, I also agree. It, it's a really nice, innovative project. I love that it's going to be at least lead gold and can help make a big difference in a positive way to this part in Arlington. I do, however, have a number of questions and concerns about whether it's actually consistent with the zoning bylaw. And I'd just like to walk through and get some answers for that. Um, one of the first has to do with the floor area ratio. Um, Mr. Nessi, if you could take a look at uh, the requirements for floor area ratio for the B4 district for a mixed yep. use building. So yep. this mixed use is, if it is a mixed use building, it's greater than 20,000 um, square feet. Um, I think it's about- um, The lot The lot is less than 20,000. I believe the lot that, is what drives that. that that's, that's correct. But the building itself is about 27,000 square feet. Of 27,000, 28,000, square feet. So in the B4 district, a mixed use building of greater than 20,000 square feet has a maximum floor area ratio of one and not 1 1.5. So I'm wondering how you square that with what you've told us, Mr. Anessi. Oh, I did what, Mr. Benson? How you square the, uh, the, uh, the um, building district height and floor area ratio regulations in B4 district with your statement that the um, FAR is 1.5 and not one. If in fact we need relief for that, uh, that again comes under mixed use. And uh, if the board uh, in its wisdom determines we do need relief for that, and I, I need to look at it more carefully, but if the board does uh, conclude that we need relief for that, 
then I would suggest to the members of the board that under mixed use, they do have the ability to grant that relief. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, I'd appreciate if you're looking at it for the next meeting. And, and Jenny, I wondered if uh, you or the staff had taken a look at that. This was in our memo. Uh, a number of comments that have been made already were in our memo, and mm -hmm. we've also noted them with the applicant. Okay. Um, next, um, uh, for both the um, open space landscaped and open space usable, I, I would have found it very helpful. And I think if you come back to actually have a chart that uh, shows where they are, because I could see various pieces of it, but it's difficult for me to put it all together. So I think if you could come back next time with a chart that shows where the open space. Um, we can try to be more more helpful in that regard, Mr. Yes, yeah, that would be very good. Thanks. I didn't see any electrical electric vehicle charging stations. Do you intend to have any there? We uh, that can be part of any transportation management uh, 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 procedure. I come back with. Okay. Well, and also as part of uh, the energy code, we're required to do that. Um, at least provide. We're going to do it for sure. We're going to be doing it, but okay. um, it would be helpful if you could show that. Okay. Um, I am a little bit concerned about um, the section 5.3.19 about the um, the um, the zoning with the setback with the for a number of reasons. One is it would have been really helpful to get a shadow study showing what the actual shadow effects would be in the R1 district when you're within the buffer zone. So I think you need to come back um, with a shadow study. Um, we did discuss that. I discussed that with the architect, Mr. Benson, and that that's certainly something we can do. It's um, actually done. I just couldn't get it to planning in time. So I, and, um, <laughs> I, I sort of didn't understand your statement, which basically says it's the position that the impact of the building um, is not significant when in the context of the plans, when we haven't had a chance to look at the shadow study. You may have seen the documentation uh, that was put in by one of the residents that showed, I think two of the buildings on the street that backed on it had solar panels on the roof. So I'd like to see whether the shadows would cast on those at any time of year. And if so, you know, what the impact would be on those. Um, it would be helpful, I think, to get a planting and landscaping plan that shows the type of plants, the trees, things like that. Um, Do that. That's also were, in process. <laughs> okay, they were lacking. You, you might have seen in the um, staff memo the issue about the signage sign and the materials. We would need to see that in the next draft. Um, I think we'd like the Department of Public Works to take a look at the stormwater management plan, which seems very extensive, but they're the folks who should take a look at it and be comfortable um, with it. Um, I think the balconies may be an issue with the setbacks, Mr. Nessie, so you might want to take a look at um, the section of the zoning bylaw about, about that, which is, um, can't find it right now, but you'll be able to find it in the zoning bylaw. Um, let me get back to whether this is actually a mixed use project, because I'm leaning the same way uh, Mr. Watson does. If you take a look at um, the definition of mixed use in the bylaw, it doesn't refer to building. It says a single multi-story structure. And at least as I look at this initially, there are two um, structures. And one of the structures is not multi-use. It's only residential. And the other one is the office with the greenhouse. So um, I'm, I'm, I raise the same concerns that uh, Mr. Watson does as to whether 
when we have two separate buildings that just are connected or two separate structures that are just connected by a sky walkway, whether they really meet the intention and even the, the exact wording, the black letter law, where it says um, mixed use. So I would like you to take another look at that also. Um, I think there was one other, one other thing I wanted to mention. Oh, the fourth story step back. Yes, it's definitely required. Um, as, as you know, through some things that have happened, there's an error in the um, zoning bylaw and the step back is required to be on the fourth floor, not the third floor. Um, and um, as you know, I was the one person on the board who voted against the special permit for another building because it didn't have a step back. My other colleagues, felt that there were mitigating circumstances because the building was pulled back from the lot line sufficiently to have the equivalent of a step back. You don't have that here. So I'm just sort of putting you on notice that I have grave concerns about approving this without a step back, even if we do have the discretion to do it without a step back. So, um, let me see if quickly if there's anything else that I just want to mention. Dean, if if there is, we're um, we still have to do public comment plus another hearing, and I have to start the warrant articles at eight o'clock. Um, so, is it okay if I come back to you? Yes, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Rita. thank you, uh, Melissa. Any questions for the applicant? Just real briefly, in terms of um, the live work, I mean, I also think it's, you know, it looks like a great design and, um, you know, a unique way to blend a mixed use project. Um, you know, in terms of the live work space, it seems that it's designed for the employees slash owners. And I don't know if, um, you know, the two Colin could speak a little to maybe the just the business model and understanding how the live work relates to this and how we ensure that, you know, the idea is that the employees work here, live here. Um, is that made for in perpetuity and how do we, you know, ensure that and do we want to ensure that? I don't believe it would be in perpetuity. Uh, I think we need to understand that Column Health is a longstanding business in the town at a different location. So actually what they're trying to do at this point is to uh, continue that relationship with the town by having this location where they can have uh, uh, meetings in one portion of the building, uh, office uh, meetings perhaps in that uh, portion of the building as well. And at the same time, provide housing for long-term employees and themselves in the building. But that doesn't mean that in perpetuity, that would be the case. And if the matter is approved, I would certainly not want to see that as a condition uh, in any approval. Yeah, if, okay. I could, if I could just add, add to that. Thank you, Bob. You know, we uh, started Column Health in Arlington on Mass Ave. That was our very first clinic, uh, also as part of our corporate office. We've outgrown the corporate office from the leadership team. So there, um, the, this office is designed just for the leadership team, just for those type of office interactions. And then myself, my family, we're gonna be in one of the units, Colin and his family is gonna be in the adjoining unit. Um, and then uh, Ray, our CFO is buying one of the middle units. Um, so it, it truly is a work, live, mixed use um, plan for us at Colin Health. Okay, thanks. And then maybe um, the architect, if, you know, we talked a little bit about the wall that's shared. So just how I could, if you could walk me through that where it is adjoining and so I can kind of see the connectivity between the two. Sure, so I think on the page that we're currently on that bottom left image, uh, we've got a bridge that connects the second floor of the residential building to the second floor of the office portion. Um, so. I'm not sure, Jenny, if you could just take your cursor and kind of hover over the, there you go, thank you. Um, that's 
that's the connection is that is that sky bridge okay okay those are my initial questions thank you thank you melissa um so i believe that most of the questions that i had um as well have been um asked by by my colleagues and i've been keeping a list of the items uh, that we will circle back on um, uh, at, at the end of, of this discussion. So um, at this point, I think I'd like to open this up for uh, public comment. And I would ask that any of the mem any members of the public wishing to ask questions or uh, make any statements related to this project please use the raise hand function in the participants uh, section at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, any member of the public wishing to speak will have up to three minutes to uh, speak. And I'd ask that you please identify yourself by your name, first name, last name, and address. So I will take uh, the uh, speakers in the order which the hands were raised, the first being Leah Broder. Hi. Leah Broder here um, from 44 Michael Street, so just down the way. Um, and I wanted to say that I really appreciate all of the work that has gone into this and also um, the, the clear commitment to sustainable principles. I th think building a project, a lead gold project in this neighborhood will be transformative. Um, I also, in terms of considering the mixed use um, of this building and considering it a single building versus two buildings, um, I guess I would ask the board to consider the intention of, um, of the project and to recognize what the other options for this parcel might be. We've had this bladed parcel here for quite some time. Um, my concern as a as a neighbor is that another project might make a giant structure that takes up you know more of the lot the 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 use of the roof as green space and all of the balconies i think is um pretty spectacular and will really have an impact from the street and this building is seen on all sides really um, in, at least as the neighborhood currently stands. So I, I think this is pretty impressive and I'm really pleased to see it. Um, I guess a concern that I have would be about, in terms of thinking about the longevity of the project and the post column health life of this project, what if it is approved as a mixed use project, what the future of that currently garage structure would be. And I guess the fit out is currently for office. Does that mean in perpetuity its office or would it, is there a possibility it could turn to commercial or retail space? I just don't understand. I don't know, I'm not familiar with the mixed use um, bylaws. So that's it. Thank you for your effort and presentation. Great, thank you so much for your comment. Um, and you know, to the to the question about the 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 use in in perpetuity um, that I think that that gets to the the question that um, Mr. Nessie was was speaking to. Um, we certainly uh, know how this is intended to be used now, but there is no guarantee that um, the, the con that would be a con continued use at that time. Uh, let's see. The next uh, speaker will be Don Seltzer. Although uh, Rachel, if if there was to be a change of use. Correct. I believe there they would have process. to come back there and modify the special permit. Absolutely, there is a process, by, but it doesn't mean that it can't be changed in the future. Thank you for that clarification, David. Uh, all right, Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Initially, I thought that this was an excellent proposal for mixed use, a health services office building and five residential units as a secondary use on a 16,000 square foot lot seems very reasonable and desirable. But then I saw the plans and three minutes isn't nearly enough to discuss all of the zoning problems. First, as others have pointed out, this is not mixed use. Mixed use is clearly defined as two uses in one building, not two buildings with different uses. 
the claim that the pedestrian bridge somehow makes it a single building is far-fetched. And be real careful going down that road because it opens up all kinds of other problems with the required setbacks. The usable open space is badly miscalculated, counting every tiny patch of greenery without regard to the 25 foot dimension in all directions requirement. Gross floor area is also badly miscalculated. It's hard to give an exact figure because of the missing dimensions on the plans. Uh, again, as other members of the board have said, there is no upper story setback. When mixed use was adopted by town meeting in 2016, it came with the assurance by this board that upper story stepbacks would be required, avoiding sidewalk crowding monstrosities. Monstrosities was the word of the board member at the time. The circulation parking and safety are just a complete disaster, beginning with the 17 foot wide central driveway. The turning radius of most cars is such that they cannot get in or out of the garage without driving over the sidewalk opposite the garage. Even that won't be enough for bigger vehicles. Inside the garage, the parking situation will be a nightmare because the drive aisle is four feet short of what the bylaw requires. The location of walls and narrow spaces mean that some drivers will be unable to get out of their cars because there's no room to swing the doors open. And where is the required loading space for the office building? And what is gonna happen when the UPS truck or some other delivery van pulls into the driveway? It is physically impossible for such a vehicle to turn around. They will have to back out onto Sunnyside blindly. And my final comment is for the architects. They have picked the worst possible spot for the solar panels in the shadow of the 36 foot tall building next door. Uh, I'd be glad to an answer any questions at some other time from the board and go into specific details on these points. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Steve Revelak. Uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Uh, as someone said earlier, this property has been somewhat blighted for a few years. And in fact, this whole end of the street is just, you know, a lot of pavement. And I am really glad to see something happening that promises to break up that massive pavement at the end of the street. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker and last speaker will be um, James Fleming. Oh, we have one more hand after this. Excuse me. Sorry, uh, James Fleming. That's okay. Uh, James Fleming, 58 Oxford Street. Um, I, I walk by this area a lot. My gym is right near here. And I agree with Steve Revelike that the area is pretty much just sort of a concrete, I, I don't know if wasteland is the right word, but it's very uninteresting. And that this building is, as shown on the screen, is much more attractive than what's there. And, and personally, I find it very nice. To the um, to the the architect, the applicant, um, my recommendation for you on parking is to to reduce the number of spaces to only as much as you think you'll actually need, and to not go with what's in the the zoning bylaw as a hard requirement. Um, if if there really is such a need, I think you'll add them anyways. And if you don't, then I'm sure the board will be willing to work with you to reduce the number. Thank you. Thank you. So we are um, unfortunately uh, coming up on, on time here. And I would like to request, I believe we have three hands that are currently up. If I could request that uh, any questions that you have, if you could please submit those in writing to the board or we'd be more than happy to take your questions and comments uh, at the end of the meeting during public comment. Um, I, I apologize, we do need to, um, to wrap this up and I need some time to, um, to, to run through the, the list of um, questions and requests for the, for the team before we start um, our, our Warren article meeting at eight o'clock. Um, so I'm just going to run through um, Attorney Anessi and the, uh, the, the applicant team um, the list of uh, comments that I've uh, been, been keeping from the board in terms of items that we'd, we'd like to see studied uh, further. Um, it looks like we would most likely be continuing this to a, a future uh, hearing date. So what I would ask is um, 
that my fellow board members, please uh, let me know as I finish running through these if there are any that I have missed. Uh, so the, uh, the first item I have is to review the venting for the garage, whether it is to the side or rear of the building or through the, the roof. The next item is uh, regarding the top level penthouse towers, looking at the materiality, the location uh, relative to the perimeter of the building um, and the, the height in terms of reducing the overall massing of the penthouse uh, elements. Um, look at the balconies that are currently um, overhanging on the, the, the side of the building in terms of their encroachment on required setbacks. Look at the required setbacks in the zoning code at the fourth floor. Uh, look at the parking, uh, the tandem parking that is proposed um, as a trade-off um, for including additional usable open space, uh, knowing that you have the possibility of looking at a, a TDM plan for this site. Review the FAR in the uh, section of the code that was cited to you but for you by Jean, whether the FAR is one versus 1.5. Um, we have a request for a chart of the open space locations and I would request that those specifically um, be identified for those that meet the uh, 25 foot length requirement. Um, I believe we addressed the electric vehicle charging stations uh, that was stated that those would be included. Uh, provide a shadow study relative to the adjacent uh, residential district. Provide a planting and landscaping plan. We understand that that's currently in progress. Uh, review the signage size and materials to ensure that those meet the, uh, the current signage uh, standards. Um, let's see, review the mixed use definition again for uh, compliance. And that is everything on my list. Board members, did I miss anything? Jean. You didn't miss anything, but there are two things I didn't quite get to that I'm going to add right now. In addition to the FAR, on the same chart, if it's mixed use of greater than 20,000 square feet, then there's a different maximum height and maximum number of stories. So they do need to look at that also. Okay. In addition. And then Mr. Anessi a couple of times said, well, we have the authority to waive or modify some of the requirements. It would be really helpful if he came back next time and told us all of those that he wants waived or modified. Thank you. Would you like me to come back with some what, Mr. Benson? The, the, the requirements that you think will need to be waived or modified okay. for us to approve this project. Got it. And, okay. and I would yep. say the reasoning behind those, whether it's a heart, no, exactly. it's for yeah. a hardship. Exactly. Thank exactly. you. Yeah. Um, David. Uh, I just wanted to add a, a couple of the comments we heard from the public. I thought they were well taken and should be investigated. Uh, one was the geometry and circulation uh, for the parking and access to the site and whether it was actually sufficient. Uh, and the other uh, was whether the solar panels proposed for this building may actually be shadowed by the neighboring building. Okay, so we'll add solar panel placement and the geometry and circulation of parking and site access. All right, anything else? Uh, Ken, sorry. Um, sorry, uh, just the, the building materials. Yes, building materials. Anything else? Okay. Um, so uh, Jenny, I know that we have a pretty full schedule um, coming up. Um, if we could identify a date so that we can take a motion to continue the hearing. At this point, I would actually say that since you've requested a number of items, many of them were noted in our memo, but um, I would ask to see if the applicant can perhaps uh, work with us to get, maybe to the 15th, um, but we would have to add it at the end of our meeting. 15th of 
When? March. The, oh, the no, 15th huh? is our next meeting. That the only way for you to That'd come back is at the end of the zoning warrant article hearings. Will, Will, how, how, I know uh, you are, Colin. Will, how are you with that? Uh, I, when would I need to have materials to the city? Would it be um, a week prior or how, how do you operate? <laughs> so if the meeting's on the 15th, when do I, when should I get that to you? You would need to get them to the town a week prior, yes. So the 8th. Um, fingers crossed. I think <laughs> we'll do our best. A lot if of it is not, if not, we can accept a continuation letter and we'll figure it out that we evening will, and continue it from there. How about that? We will do, we will do our best. And if okay. we need to ask for a continuance, a further continuance, uh, we can do that. Sure. Thank you. So the 15th. Yeah. Great. Thank yeah. you. So do I hear a, a motion from the board to uh, continue this, uh, continue this docket number to uh, March 15th? Uh, Oh, no, it's okay. Second. Okay. Uh, we will take a roll call vote. Uh, any discussion? Okay. Uh, we'll take a roll call vote uh, on this motion. Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? And I am yes as well. Um, so we will be continuing docket 3647 to March 15th. Thank you very much for the presentation today. We look forward to seeing you in a few weeks. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. Let's see. So uh, for our agenda items, um, Mr. Anessi, I am wondering if I could move the uh, 400 to 402 Mass Ave to the end of the meeting uh, after our warrant article public hearings, because unfortunately I do need to begin those uh, this evening. So we could do one of two things. We could either con continue this, which I would hate to do because I I, I know we, 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 um, uh, we, we had you come back specifically tonight uh, we can certainly contact you if you would like to step off until you know when we're when we're getting towards the end of the Warren article public hearings. Um, but unfortunately, I, I I do need to move to the Warren article public hearings uh, as they were advertised for for eight p.m. Um, well, I uh, Ken and Cynthia, how do you feel about that? Are you there? Uh, this is Ken. Um, I could go either way, Bob. Cynthia? Either way, I'll, I'll leave it up to Ken, whatever he feels comfortable with. All right. Okay. Well, let's uh, try to hang in and uh, let's see where it goes. All right. Okay. Thank you. I'll do my best to keep moving this portion of the meeting along. Thank you very much for your, for your flexibility. Okay, uh, so with that, we will also uh, move item number two on the agenda uh, to follow the Warren article public hearings as well. All right, so with that, we will move to item three and we will now open the public hearing for the Warren articles related to the zoning bylaws for Springtown meeting. Uh, so we will be holding four nights of hearings as published in the schedule on Novus agenda for a total of 22 warrant articles. Consistent with the past, the redevelopment board will be hearing from the article applicants and public wishing to speak on each of these articles as scheduled. Applicants will have three minutes to address the board. The board will then pose any questions to the applicants followed by a period for open public comment on each warrant article. Note the board note that the board will reserve final discussion and voting on each article until the last night of hearings, which is on April 5th. Um, let's see. So before we move into uh, the first item, Article 39, I just would like to speak to um, the, uh, the 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 public hearing. Um, uh, the uh, how we'll be conducting the public hearing this evening. So the subject matter of the hearings is posted on the agenda. Uh, any person wishing to address, address the redeve redevelopment board on the subject matter of the agenda shall uh, signify their desire to speak by raising their hand when I call on you uh, for consideration of those items. 
Uh, again, everybody will have three minutes to be able to speak. The board may receive any oral or written evidence, but such evidence is restric restricted to the subject matter of the agenda item. Immaterial or unduly repetitious evidence may be excluded. Uh, those people presenting at public hearing are requested not to applaud or otherwise express approval or disapproval of any statements made or action taken at such hearing. Hearing participants shall re refrain from interrupting other speakers and conduct themselves in a civil, courteous manner. And speakers should address all questions through the chair. Speakers shall not attempt to engage in debate or dialogue with the ARB members or other hearing participants. Questions may or may not be answered during this public hearing. So with that, we will move to the first article on our agenda, which is Article 39, uh, which has been uh, inserted by the request uh, of uh, Christopher Loretti and 10 registered voters. Mr. Loretti, are you here with us this evening? I am, Madam Chair. Okay, wonderful. If you could uh, begin any remarks that you've prepared, that would be fantastic. Great, thank you. Chris Loretti, 56 Adams Street. Uh, given the limited time for, for the public to be heard, I'll try not to repeat what I wrote to the board, but I do wish to correct some misinformation that others have provided. This amendment does not create any new use restrictions. It merely clarifies that the use prohibit prohibitions already in the zoning bylaw apply to mixed uses, exactly as the ARB explained to town meeting. When the mixed use zoning bylaw amendment came before a town meeting, I offered a similar amendment based on the belief that developers could use the loose language of the definition to sneak prohibited uses into the mix, into mixed use developments. The ARB responded, and I quote, that's not correct. We've worked with both inspectional services, the head of inspectional services, as well as town council on the wording that's before you. And only the uses that are permitted in a particular district are the ones that can happen in a mixed use in that district. So just to clarify on that point, end quote. Any claims that the ARB thought it was granted permission by town meeting to include prohibited uses within mixed use developments are completely false. They are belied by ARB's own statements at town meeting. There was no need to adopt the amendment I offered at town meeting based on what the ARB told the meeting. The town zoning bylaw provides the ARB flexibility to grant special permits subject to EDR. This amendment does not change that in any way. EDR standards are in addition to the regular special permit criteria, not in lieu of them. EDR does not allow the ARD, ARB to pick and choose which uses are special permit uses and which are not. That power belongs to town meeting. Mixed use projects go through the same EDR special permit process as any other special permit use acted upon by the ARB. They get no special EDR review. Neither town council nor anyone else has cited any case law supporting the claim that zoning bylaw requirements can be waived as part of the special permit process absent a variance. Staff seem to misunderstand the scope of this article. Residential development is allowed in all business districts as indicated in the table of use regulations. This amendment does not change that in any way. Residential uses are still allowed by the bylaw. The amendment is not limited to developments on more than one lot and has nothing to do with conflicting zoning district. It applies to all lots where mixed use is allowed. It merely says, for example, that since town meeting has determined auto body shops and welding, sh welding shops are not allowed in any business district, you can't sneak them into a business district by combining them into a mixed use. The master plan was created to guide changes to the zoning bylaw. If there are additional uses the ARB deems desirable in a particular zoning district, it need only submit a warrant article to amend the table of use regulations, just as it always has done so in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the board for, uh, for questions, I'd like to see if um, Aaron uh, from the uh, Department of Planning has uh, any items uh, from the memo that was prepared that she would like to uh, bring to the board's attention. Sorry, fumbling with the mute button. Um, Aaron Zwerko, Assistant Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, I don't have anything else to add in addition to what was in the memo. I think um, our memo stands um, on its own um, in, in light of, um, you know, 
uh, reviewing projects relative to mixed use over the course of um, the year since this article um, was first introduced to the redevelopment board for annual town meeting 2020. Great, thank you, Erin. Thank you. So I'll open it up to um, the members of the board for uh, questions. Uh, we'll start with Ken. Um, I have no questions. Great. Um, next, we will go to Jean. Any questions or comments? Yes, just a couple. Um, uh, Ms. Loretti, thank you for putting in this warrant article and for the explanation. I actually don't see any ambiguity right now in the bylaw. And I think that the board has done what's appropriate. Um, but let me tell you what my concerns are in addition to the ones mentioned um, by the staff. And, and this came up with a project that uh, for which we did issue a special permit, which allowed um, two um, commercial office spaces and four um, residential units in the B1 zone. And we all thought that was a very appropriate use of the property added to the streetscape, um, added to the town, provided a little bit more housing. But as I read your um, amendment, if it's adopted, that building could not have been more than three residential units. Do you agree? I do, to the extent that three is limited in that zoning district now, if it's not part of the mixed use, that's absolutely right. Yes, I would yeah, agree. So, I mean, and that that's sort of, you know, aside from what the, the staff mentioned, I wish you had narrowed this more because I think it's overly broad. And while I can understand um, in some ways you're saying, you know, look, I, you know, we shouldn't allow certain things in certain districts, I'm not sure I agree with all of your analyses, but even if I did, I think it's overly broad for that. Um, so maybe you could consider some modification. The other thing that I would ask you to consider is it's really bad form to put a substantive requirement in um, a definition, which is what you've done. And if you wanted to do this, a much better place would have been to put it in, oops, now I lost my page, my page in the bylaws, but the, a much better place to have put it would have been in 5.2, um, where you could have just added um, something under the use regulations applicable in all or multiple districts, because what you don't want to do and what you've done is basically hidden a substantive provision in a definition. So I'd, I'd like you, if you're going to go forward, Ms. Loretti, to think about whether it makes more sense to move the substantive provision to um, 5.2 and maybe make a 5.2.5 related to mixed use. That's it. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David. Uh, I concur with Mr. Benson's comments. Uh, also, I, I think that there are already one or two circumstances in the zoning bylaw where uh, a choice was made to specifically constrain what could be uh, in mixed use in a particular district and that uh, uh, if, if Mr. Loretti would like to propose uh, those kinds of limitations, that would be more appropriate than, than this overly broad uh, change to the definition. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Melissa. Um, I do not have questions at this time. Thank you, Melissa. And uh, I also concur with, with my colleagues and just note that, um, you know, per our discussion with uh, town council on this matter as well, that 
our current environmental design review process is oriented towards um, permitting projects that are appropriate for, for these districts. So uh, any other questions before I open this up for public comment? Great. So uh, any members of the public wishing to ask any questions or make any comments on this proposed uh, Warren article, if you could pl uh, please use the raise hand function. I will call on you in the order received. Please remember to uh, identify yourself by your first, last name and address, uh, and you will have three minutes to make your comments. So the first uh, speaker will be, uh, I believe it's Patricia Warden. Unless Mr. Warden, I think that might be yes, you. It is, it is Mr. Warden. Great, thank you. Uh, John Warden, Jason Street. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I will not even take three minutes. I, I wonder if it would be possible for the board or uh, Ms. Rate or somebody to summon Mr. Bennell, wherever he is, to come before the board and tell the board and the public uh, what he meant when he said the, the words that Mr. Loretti quoted earlier in the meeting. That mixed use will not allow any anything in the district which is not already a, a, a permitted use in that district, and 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 uh, and then um, I mean those those were not not my words; those were his because I was one of those who argued uh, in favor of uh, Mr. Loretti's uh, amendment uh, at the, the 2016 town meeting, and we got all these assurances from Mr. Bennell and Mr. Kayer uh, that don't worry about it; it's it, it's in hand if if it, if, if it isn't in that isn't allowed in that district, uh, it can't happen just because we're calling it mixed use. And, uh, and then, um, and now everybody is, seems to want to uh, uh, take the position that, well, uh, I don't know, uh, what did he mean by those words? Be because you, those words are not being followed. And, and that, that is the whole problem here. That's why we're doing now what should have been done in 16 uh, to nail it down. I mean, we were, we were told as I said, you know, this is supposed to be a, a society of laws, not of men. Uh, but the town meeting thought, well, we can rely on these guys. They're, they're our redevelopment board members. They wouldn't, they wouldn't kid us. They wouldn't try to pull something over on us. But now, I don't know. I don't know if that's true. So I, I would, I would ask if that, if, if Mr. Bennell could come back and clarify for us. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. I'll just ad address that uh, the specific uh, text that has been cited was part of a much larger discussion. And again, the redevelopment board believes that we are um, uh, working in, uh, in, in the manner in which the town uh, bylaw was, was written. And um, again, it is oriented towards the permitting projects that are appropriate for these districts. So we'll move to the, the next um, speaker, uh, Aaron Holman. Uh, Mr. Holman, you are Test. on mute. Test, can you hear me? I can now, please, thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, I will speak, Aram Holman, H-O-L-L-M-A-N, first name A-R-A-M, ending with M as in Mary. I wish to speak in support of article 39. Uh, in doing so, I seek to limit housing in this mixed use to the three units that Jean Benson described recently. I seek to limit mixed use to the vision of retail and commercial space on the first floor uh, with a limited quantity of housing above it because wholesale conversion of commercial space to mostly market rate housing is detrimental to our commercial sector. And it increases the already excessive dependence of the town of Arlington on the residential property tax. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Brian McBride. Brian, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, hey, I'm Brian McBride. I'm on uh, Eastern Avenue up, uh, in the Heights. Um, 
So I'm just a regular citizen. I don't have a lot of familiarity with the nuances of the zoning rules. Um, but I do have some concerns about the outsized developments uh, proposed are happening in the town. I'm concerned about the pressure from the biotech boom in Cambridge uh, on development uh, and um, out of scale housing in the town. So that's that's what I what brought me to the meeting tonight. And I just want to offer my opinion that I hope the, the board and the town can find a way to manage this development appropriately, uh, keep the, the feel, the scale, the community sense of the town without um, overdevelopment. And I feel that this uh, regulation may have some impact on that. Again, I don't know all the rules of the, of the zoning system, but it does seem like there's some opportunity um, for uh, unintended consequences when prohibited uses are allowed under um, a, a legal structure that perhaps I don't understand that well. I, I hope my message is clear. Um, again, I'm not familiar with the nuances, but I do have concern about this regulation in terms of development of the town. So thank you for listening. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Carl Wagner, 30 Edge Hill Road in, in Arlington. Um, I wanted to give a town meeting member perspective from 2016, uh, particularly because there might be some town meeting members here, but also for the board, because not all of you were, were present or at least presented at the 2016 town meeting where I and many others enthusiastically voted, I think by large numbers to allow the mixed use uh, zoning change. And we did it because we looked at sections of our retail districts in Arlington and said, oh my goodness, we want to provide accessory apartments in those business districts to promote the business districts, to help the businesses out. And we really thought that that was going to happen. And it seems that somewhere along the line, uh, the, the speakers that spoke from the ARB and from the town and, and the reasons that we said yes in town meeting to that have been lost. In fact, I would offer for any of the public and, and for the ARB who would like to see what actually happened, there is a video at mixeduse.arfrr.org. You can see the recording. It's, it's, it's clear that what Mr. Loretti is proposing brings the mixed use law as it's being applied by the ARB back to the way that town meeting said yes to it, the way that it was voted. I think this is very important that we not go off the rails here. And speaking to new members and, and individual members of the ARB, I would hope that you don't take this article as any kind of criticism, implicit or not. I don't think that's the case. I think what is being asked is to clarify that town meeting said that mixed use legislation should be a certain thing and to bring it back there and to help make the collective decisions of the ARB better going forward. There have been two or three in the past year that are not in the spirit or even the letter of the mixed use law from, from 2016. So, so please consider that. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker will be Steve Revelak. Hi, hello, Ma <clears throat> hello, Madam Chair, Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, I was a town meeting member in 2016 and I voted for the mixed use provisions. And I also voted against the amendment, which is sub substantially similar to uh, the current Article 39. Now I cannot speak for town meeting as a whole, but I can explain the rationale for my own individual votes. The reason I voted the way I did was largely because I knew that every mixed use project would come up for environmental design review and it would have the public hearing process that it entailed, that EDR entails. So there's nothing done by right here. You go to a hearing and you apply for a special permit. Um, I think the board has done a good job using its discretion. I like the project, the projects that have been permitted so far, and I hope to see more of them in the future. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. This should really be an easy one for the board to support. It should be viewed in the same way as many other administrative changes that fix faulty wording in the bylaw. In this case, it is the unintended ambigu ambiguous language of the 2016 mixed use bylaw. The two board members who presented this article before town meeting were crystal clear in the intent. 
only the uses that are permitted in a particular district are the ones that can happen in a mixed use in that district. The same words were repeated over and over again at town meeting. I could play that recording right now, but I trust that all the board members have viewed the video clip. Certainly all town meeting members are going to get to view it for spring town meeting. Another speaker this evening has claimed that the zoning bylaws are really just guidelines that the board has the flexibility to simply disregard any portions passed by town meeting that it finds inconvenient. We will see how town meeting members respond to that argument. The flexibility that is spoken of only applies to the particular qualitative standards listed in the EDR process. It is absurd to suggest that it applies broadly to the entire zoning bylaw, in particular to the table of uses. The flawed interpretation that mixed use means any two uses in any business district is diametrically opposite of what was promised to town meeting. It is really the duty of this board to fix that problem and to amend the language of the bylaw to reflect what town meeting actually approved in 2016. To shirk that duty and recommend no action on this is going to cause great harm to the credibility of this board when it speaks at future town meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to speak on this article? All right, um, any other questions or comments from members of the board? And I apologize, I'm trying to skip through to see if I see any. Okay, seeing none, we will uh, close comment on uh, article 29, excuse me, sorry, I need to get back to my agenda. 39. 39, thank you. The screen has the next one. Thank you. So the next uh, item on the agenda is Article 40. And uh, this article was uh, submitted by uh, John Warden and 10 registered voters. So uh, Mr. Warden, uh, if you would like to speak on this, uh, you may uh, have three minutes to address the board. I'm unmuted. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, John Warden, uh, Jason Street. and. I sent a memo to the board uh, describing the um, what I had in mind here. I, I, did you, if, if you didn't all see it or read it, I'll be glad to read it to you. Um, uh, we all received uh, the 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 um, items that were submitted with this. So any any summary comments you you have? Otherwise, we'd be happy to 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 just uh, discuss any comments with you. Well, I. I um... Okay, well, if you, if, if you read the memo, you know what the position is, that the, the, um, uh, the, the law presently provides that uh, as of right, uh, doesn't say as of right, but it's not, it's not specified otherwise, uh, someone who has uh, a, a building with both commercial and residential units in it uh, may uh, take a, res a commercial unit and turn it into a residential unit. Um, and it seems to me that um, there are two aspects really. Uh, one, that that should be by special permit since it was a special permit who allowed that building to exist in the first place. And two, that um, if we're gonna create the, the, uh, more residential units in this town, the only kind of residential units we need in this town are affordable units. And so we should, uh, that, and that is the other aspect of this, this article. Uh, and uh, I would say that, you know, that there's a lot of talk about, a lot of people give lip service to affordable housing, but, but, but when, when, the, when, the, uh, when the rubber hits the road, uh, where, uh, where is it? We, we, we look for excuses to why we can't do it. It's not practical, it's not just, it's not this, it's not that. But we never would have got the inclusionary zoning bylaw through if some, a bunch of people had, had not felt that, you know, we really have to do something positive about this and really push affordable housing because that's what we need. And I just point the, the, to the, the, uh, 
the building, that building in, in Summer Street, is supposedly a mixed use building. Well, 11 residential units, so the developer only had to provide one affordable and, 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 and one commercial unit, the developer's own office. And so under, under the law as it stands now, he could convert that, uh, that uh, office into another residential unit. And, uh, and there's 12, which, which would have required affordable housing had he done it that way in the first place. So it, 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 betray, it, it illustrates rather dramatically, not only the, the folly of the mixed use, the, uh, the, the way you, you manipulated the mixed use bylaw, but, but the, the way the, the, the inclusionary zoning bylaw is being manipulated. So this is designed to at least have a public comment on the thing and, and, and if something must go residential, but let's, let's do it the kind of residential that we need in this town, not, not more luxury apartments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, Aaron, did you have anything uh, that you would like to add other than uh, what was contained in your memo? Uh, no, I don't have anything to add in, um, in addition to what was in the memo. Um, yep, thank you. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, so we will uh, run through the members of the board for any questions or uh, comments uh, related to this Warren article. I'll start with Ken. Thank you, Rachel. Um, no, uh, I just have two comments. One is, um, yes, we do need more uh, affordable units. And these affordable units are, are achieved in uh, two ways. One in the public sector, which um, Pam and her uh, nonprofit organization is doing a great job on. And the other is the, uh, the private sector, which is the inclusionary. Um, and that is the two avenues we have for uh, affordable housing. But I would disagree with Mr. Warren saying that's, that's all we need. I think we need a balanced set of housing, which would include workforce housing, you know, the teachers, the firemen, the policemen that can uh, live in this town if they work in this town. And I don't think um, just by building affordable is enough. I think we got to do a broad range. And that's all I have. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Thank you. I agree with what the staff wrote in their comments, and I agree with what um, Kendra said. I've spent much of my adult life being an advocate for affordable housing, but I also, as a result of that, understand the realities of what it takes to get affordable housing in this town or anywhere in the metropolitan area. And what this would basically do is serve to calcify development and progress in the town in some pretty bad ways. In addition, I believe it evinces a misunderstanding of how things work. Let's take the Summer Street project as just one example. It needed a special permit because it was mixed use. They just can't convert it all to residential because it would be in violation of the special permit. Similarly, in this particular situation, the, the part that Mr. Warden proposes to change is one where either people have the right to um, have um, a residential units there or they have to go in for a special permit anyhow. So it doesn't serve the purpose of creating more affordable housing. It does serve the purpose of making progress on all sorts of housing more difficult in the town. And I agree with what Mr. Lau and the staff had to say in response to this article. Thank you, Jean. Anything else? Okay, uh, David. Uh, I will agree with uh, the staff and the comments of my colleagues and not repeat them and simply uh, ask uh, that if Mr. Warden uh, has more information on how the economics uh, would 
work to allow for housing development uh, at all, even uh, aside from affordable housing. If this change were made, I would be happy to, to hear that information from him. Uh, thank you, David. Melissa? Um, thank you. I guess I'm still learning about kind of where our bylaws are on this. I mean, I think in terms of affordable housing, at least something I want to keep in mind is kind of the end goal with it in terms of helping people. And so it's also, you know, I think it's someone mentioned, you know, the housing options created, meaning small and different sizes, um, as well as, you know, capital A affordable, lowercase affordable housing. So um, strategies for across the board on that is kind of things I'm thinking about. So I have to consider this a little bit more. Thank you. And I also agree with my, my colleagues and don't have anything uh, further, further to add. So uh, uh, any other comments before I open this up to public comment? Okay, seeing none, I will open this uh, Article 40 up to uh, public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak on this article, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Uh, you will have three minutes to speak and I will remind you to please introduce yourself by your first, last name and address. So the first speaker will be Judith Garber. Hi, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can, thank you. Yeah, Judith Garber, Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I, I would just be curious to for a little more clarification from the redevelopment board about how um, requiring more affordable housing will make it harder to create more housing. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I don't believe that uh, Jean, that I think that that comment was specific for some of the comments you made, although I don't think that that was the intent of, of your comment. Did you wish to respond? Yeah, we, I, I think of either I slightly misspoke or Judith slightly misunderstood what I said. I didn't say that the creation of more affordable housing would lead to other sorts of housing. I said that if you put this in place, you wouldn't get either because it's not financially feasible for affordable under the circumstances. So what you could get is somebody who wants to put in, let's say a market rate unit that wouldn't be able to do it as a result of that. It's not going to force people into doing affordable housing because now they can choose affordable housing or no affordable housing. Under this proposal, they can't put in market rate, they can't put in workforce housing, anything like that. Okay, that, that, that helps clarify, thank you. Okay. Thank you both. Uh, the next speaker will be Carl Wagner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Carl Wagner, 30 Edgehill Road, uh, for members of the public, as well as the ARB. I'm sorry to be speaking on two items consecutively, and I did not intend to. But as there are not others that are commenting on Mr. Warden's reasonable amendment here, article here, I just wanted to put in my understanding of why this is so important. People in the public may not know that in 2019, the town meeting overwhelmingly said no to many so-called density or developer bonuses. In other words, uh, large buildings with much larger height and, and envelope size, much uh, less setback on the street, fewer parking requirements, et cetera. It goes on and on. You can look at 2019. Uh, however, those things that we said no to for apartment buildings and for large new uh, new structures, those things are basically in mixed use law. So developers can build large mixed use buildings with all those things we said no to for regular apartment buildings in 2019, as long as they do this accessory apartments and retail or, or commercial with it. And as we talked about in article 39, there's a danger that the, the spirit of the law is making accessory businesses for large apartment buildings. And what I think Mr. Um, Mr. Um, Warden is trying to say here is, if the developer or the owner of the building says, oh, I couldn't rent out those few retail spaces that you forced me to make, I'd like to convert the building to entirely residential or more residential. Mr. Warden is saying, well, 
if the law or, or you are going to allow them to do that or whoever it is that allow them to do that, the, 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 the conversion away from mixed use to entirely or nearly entirely residential has to go to lower the cost of living in Arlington. It has to result in more affordability because as we know, the apartment building that's between the high school and the, uh, the stop and shop, those units rent at $3,000 a month, which is a lot more than the average of the old apartments here. And so Mr. Warden's amendment is to keep developers from misusing the zoning bylaw mixed use to make large apartment buildings that they could not make under the 2019 laws. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Steve Revelak. <laughs> Hello, Madam Chair, Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, I'm gonna be a little blunt. The, there are two reasons why I have seen, I've seen people propose affordable housing provisions for two reasons. One of them is to encourage the production of low and moderate income housing, which is, which is great. Another one is to discourage the production of any housing whatsoever, whether it's affordable or not. So when you require units to be statutory capital A affordable, it generally means that, you know, the person who builds it is likely to lose money on it and you need something else to make the economics work out. So a restriction without something to compensate for the economics is just a barrier. Um, now, I mean, when our bylaw was passed in the mid seventies, there was a, you know, a big concern at the time about population growth, uh, a proliferation of apartments. And we changed the bylaws to basically ensure that the, to limit the opportunity for population growth by limiting the amount of housing. I mean, I see this uh, proposal as going in that direction. And I don't necessarily think that, you know, that strategy of 45 years ago is um, really helping us to take advantage of, um, you know, the economic growth in the region. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be Matthew Owen. Hi, I'm Matthew Owen, 164 Forest Street. And I'd just like to echo um, what the board members have been saying about this. Um, I think att most attempts to sort of limit housing um, with the idea that more of it should be affordable just usually has the, uh, effect intended or not to reduce the total amount of housing and not actually encourage the building of affordable housing. Um, and I would disagree with part of the premise of this in that um, Arlington um, isn't in need of market rate housing in addition to affordable. I think it needs both of those and um, we should be doing whatever we can to encourage the building of um, both market rate and affordable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Elizabeth Dre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Elizabeth Dre, town meeting member, precinct eight. Um, I admit to being new uh, to all of these zoning discussions um, and I'm trying to learn, but I think that I'm, I'm not understanding Mr. Revelak's um, connection or statement that people who there's sort of these two arguments um, for people who want to get to affordable housing. And one of them is working to discontinue the production of any housing. And I'm not really sure how that relates to this particular article or an article because this, this housing is already built. So it, it wouldn't prevent the building of this apartment building. Uh, and what I'm understanding is, is then when the builder decides to or entertains the idea of, of, of changing in the, the, the mixed use, the commercial space, um, because they can't rent it or for whatever reason, they wanna change it to make a choice to change that to an apartment, then that's when this is applied, right? That's when they, that, that option is given, but only if it's affordable housing. So it's not preventing the builder from building. It's just when they're about to make a decision, keep it commercial or move it to housing, that's the decision to make. And if we are serious in Arlington about affordable housing, then we need to do some really specific measures 
to get there. Um, and this seems, you know, this seems a way to do it. Um, and I, I, I do see that builders build just the limit. They build right under so that they don't have to have more affordable housing. And that disturbs me that they can get around that um, in, this, in this venue. So I would uh, encourage you to support it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is James Fleming. Thank you. James Fleming, um, 58 Oxford Street. This is a clarification on a comment that Carl Wagner made about new construction rents being higher, um, specifically the building across from the high school being $3,000 a month. New construction can't be used as your baseline for what rent is because the developer has a mortgage, they have capital costs that they've spent, they need to get the money back over a fixed period of time. So they have to charge higher rent. If you look at older buildings, they rent for lower because they've been around for 100 years. The, no one's paying a mortgage on it. They're just paying the taxes. So if you're going to use cost comparison, you have to pick something that's more reasonable. Or you have to say, well, what's the alternative for something that's recently built? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other? Uh, it looks like we have Aram Holman. Aaron Holman, 12 Whittemore Street. Uh, I am speaking in favor of Article 40. Uh, a brief response to Mr. Law, who wants workforce housing. Uh, the affordable housing, which is being built in Arlington, which I think we can all admit, is nowhere near adequate and promises to never be adequate into the far future, really isn't affordable. It really is your workforce housing for people in the lower middle and middle class making, say, on the order to sixty to $80,000 a year. I don't think that's really what was envisioned by affordable housing. So I think we ought to define our terms a little bit more precisely before we start bandying around, you know, concepts of what the appropriate AMI is for it. Uh, I'm speaking in favor of it uh, for other reasons as well. My priority as an Arlington resident is what the town needs most of all is affordable housing and more commercial space. And our commercial space has continued to either stagnate or decline for about the 20 plus years that I have lived in Arlington. At the same time, as we have seen more market rate housing go up, for various reasons, including some which speakers have mentioned, uh, the costs have gone up. This article is basically just going to limit the ability of the Arlington Redevelopment Board to allow, by special permit, private property owners to convert existing commercial space into densely packed residential spaces that lacks the setbacks normally associated with residential housing. To parse that more simply, inferior second class housing. This is really a gross abuse of the mixed use bylaw, which we talked about earlier, which envisioned a mix of commercial retail space on the first floor with residential space above. Instead, this is allowing the ARB to convert commercial spaces to almost completely residential use with a minimal token and often non-viable commercial space remaining as a SOP to the concept of mixed use and other people have referred to the token offices proposed. And this violates one of the basic purposes of zoning to distinguish between residential and commercial use. On top of it, it exempts the development from setback regulations typically required of residential spaces, the kind of things which make decent housing, a certain amount of green space, a certain amount of parking. Article 40 attempts to limit this damage. It specifies that these conversions can be exempted if and only if the residential units to be constructed are entirely affordable. And again, this is what Arlington needs. This is consistent with our need for affordable housing. It is consistent with our need for more commercial space. We should not allow market-driven conversion. And it really is market-driven conversion Let's not allow these sorry excuses of, oh, I can't rent the space. That's not what it's about. 
This is market-driven conversion of commercial space into residential space, and at the very least, and I don't approve of it, but at the very least, if we're going to do that, it ought to be affordable housing. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Any other members of the public wishing to comment? Seeing none, we will uh, close public comment on Article 40. Uh, any further uh, questions or comments from the board before we uh, move on to the next article? Okay, seeing none, we will uh, move on to Article 34. So this uh, article is a zoning bylaw amendment related to uh, marijuana uses. And I will turn this over to Aaron uh, for the uh, presentation of the article. Thanks, Rachel. Um, I'll quickly summarize what is in the memo. Um, so in uh, late 2020, the Cannabis Control Commission had opened a comment period on updates to the regulations for recreational um, use and medical use of marijuana um, and recently approved and codified updates to the regulations in early January. So this amendment takes, um, takes care of two items. Um, the first more simple um, uh, piece of it is to update certain definitions, update um, citations um, that were include that are included in the current zoning bylaw to update it to the new regulations that were codified, um, and also um, bring our bylaw into compliance with how the Cannabis Control Commission's regulations require um, us to or cities and towns to measure the buffer area. So um, those are the simpler items. First, the um, more complicated. Um, part of the amendment is dealing with um, delivery of product um, to consumers. So the Cannabis Control Commission created two uh, license types, um, the marijuana courier and the marijuana delivery operator. Um, I will note that these license types are only available for um, economic empowerment applicants and social equity program participants for at least three years. Um, neither the two, um, well, the currently operating dispensary in the Heights, nor the recently permitted dispensary on Broadway um, fall into these categories, nor do the two um, uh, other retail establishments that are under consideration for that third host community agreement for um, a retail space um, fall into that category. Um, but practically speaking, these two new license types um, then create three sort of uh, ways to deliver product to consumers. Um, the first one, as I noted in my memo, is the retail direct delivery. So this would be a retail shop actually delivering product um, from their dispensary to the consumer um, with the consumer not having to come into the store. The second practical um, use is the third party delivery, um, similar to ordering a pizza um, or you know, other sorts of food items through Uber Eats or through Grubhub. Um, it is a third party. They pick up the product from the establishment and then deliver it to the consumer. Um, and then the last item is basically um, a distribution center. So the distribution center is um, similar to a fulfillment center where um, they, that establishment has product for many different um, sellers. Um, consumers can visit their website, select what they want, and that establishment would then deliver the item to the consumer. I will note that the delivery only, or the marijuana delivery operator does not allow a public facing space. Um, it is entirely basically online um, as you might shop on Amazon. Um, so how it, how it breaks down for our zoning amendment is that I created a use marijuana delivery only retailer. Um, I defined it per the um, regulations. Um, and because the land use type is very similar to a production facility, 
I um, allowed it by special permit. Um, the special permit is always in front of the redevelopment board um, in the B4 and industrial district. Um, there's also something known as a delivery endorsement. Um, so the different establishment types can receive a delivery endorsement from um, the Cannabis Control Commission, and that would allow them to um, uh, pursue a, a career license. Um, and then third, the third party um, delivery, the, the Uber Eats style delivery, um, that is all licensing that is ha handled by the Cannabis Control Commission. Um, essentially, the only space that might be used in Arlington is office space for that, so that um, delivery drivers have a place to, um, to rest, um, recharge, and move forward. Um, so uh, I think I'll um, stop here. Um, I'm happy to answer questions from the board members and from the public on the um, the, the specifics of this of this amendment. Great, thank you, Erin, and thanks for all the specificity in the in the memo. Uh, I'll start with uh, Ken for any questions or comments. No, I have no questions. Thank you, Ken. Jean? Yeah, this is a really excellent job incorporating the new regulations and some of the changes in the regulations. The only thing I'm curious about, I'm not opposed to it, I'm just wondering um, of the choice of allowing the marijuana delivery only retailer in B4 and industrial zones, but not in other places. Can you speak to that a little more, Aaron? Yeah, um, so I, I, the land use type basically being a large warehouse lends mm -hmm. itself to our existing um, use category of a marijuana production facility, which is allowed in the B4 and the industrial districts. In these areas, you might have um, the, the building type or the space to be able to have a warehouse type facility um, and then associated parking. Um, it didn't feel that it would be appropriate in some of the other zoning districts, again, um, following the, the zoning that we put into place in late 2018, which did locate the production facilities in the B4 and the industrial districts. Um, so, so really being that the land use types um, of those two uses were, this, were very similar, um, that's why I selected to, to limit it to B4 and industrial. Okay, sounds good, thanks so much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, David. Thank you, Aaron. This is very thorough. Um, just to be clear, uh, we don't, we as a town don't have a choice of whether to come into compliance with these regulations. We have to. Where we have a choice is uh, in uh, choosing a reasonable way to implement the, the new requirements. And I think that's what you've done here as, as you've explained. So uh, I, I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you, that is correct um, uh, in the way that you framed it. Um, we can tinker with it, but we need to allow these uses. Great, uh, thank you, David. Uh, Melissa, any questions? Um, yeah, thank you, Erin. I think um, I'm just curious, has there been a demand for this? Have you seen, have you received calls for these uses and to what degree? Um, so uh, recently, um, within probably the last quarter of 2020, um, we did hear from um, an establishment that was looking to do um, delivery. Um, it would really be, it was based on the, the previous type of um, delivery or transport operator license where the only use would really be an office space. Um, the, uh, the way that the zoning um, would, is written is that any sort of establishment um, uh, needs to abide by the, the buffers that are included in the existing zoning. Um, and unfortunately, um, we couldn't, we couldn't, uh, the, the contact couldn't figure out a good spot for their use um, with some of the limitations. Um, but it, it uh, beyond that, um, on these new type of uses, we have not um, received any uh, inquiries. Again, it is limited to um, participants in those two equity programs that I had mentioned. 
um, and our existing dispensaries um, do not fall into that category. Thank you. Great, thank you both. Uh, any further questions before I open this up for public comment? All right, seeing none, uh, we will now open this up for public comment. Any member of the public wishing to speak on this uh, article, please uh, use the raise hand function. All right, seeing none, we will close uh, public comment for Article 34. Thank you, Erin. Uh, we'll now move to uh, any, any further questions from the board before we move to the next article. Great, so we will now move to Article uh, 28, which is the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for Affordable Housing Requirements. And Erin uh, will also uh, present this article. Um, so as noted in the memo, um, the uh, section 30 of chapter 219 of the acts of 2016 broadened um, the time period of special permits um, from two years to three years. Um, and while um, the section in 335B does correctly reference three years, um, we noted that this um, reference to two years should be updated considering the lifetime of a special permit. Um, so it's, it definitely, it, well, it falls into the category of sort of a minor amendment. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, Ken, any questions? Nope, it's mainly administrative. Great, Gene? Yeah, this is fine, it needs to be done. David? No questions. Melissa? Okay. Uh, I will now open this up for public comment. Any, uh, any members of the public wishing to speak, please use the raise hand function. Okay, seeing none, we will uh, move on to the next article. Uh, so that is article 29, uh, apartment conversion. Erin, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, so it was um, pointed out at, um, how probably since 2020 is like the missing year now um in it has far back as 2019 that there's no definition for apartment conversion which is a use that is included in our table of uses so using some clues in the zoning bylaw namely the description of the r4 townhouse district um, and the b1 neighborhood district um, the staff and i crafted um, this definition that explains um, essentially what an apartment conversion is, is um, the conversion of a larger single or two family structure um, into, um, to divide it up into apartments with no exterior changes. Great, thank you. Uh, Ken, any questions? Nope. Jean? Yeah, this is another one that needs to be done. I do, I do have a suggestion though, and I know we went through this some time ago and I maybe should have raised it then, which, I'm just wondering whether it shouldn't simply be designed for one family or two family use, but also for duplex and three family, because what if you look at what we're allowing through the zoning bylaw, apartment conversion could theoretically be of a duplex or a three family. So I think this is needed. I think we just, just think about slightly amending this so it includes those other two types of housing, because there is a technical difference in the bylaw between two family and duplex. We should probably put three family in, but with that suggested change, I th think this is another thing that's just needed to tighten up the understanding of the bylaw. Thank you, Jean. Uh, Aaron, any questions or comments back to Jean on that suggestion? Uh, no, I, I don't have, um, I, think it, I think it would be fine. Um, it would be all inclusive um, just for those types of um, structures that might exist in those zoning districts. Great, thank you. David? Uh, I have no further comments. Okay, Melissa, you're good, all right. Uh, so we will now open this up for any public questions or comments.
Okay, seeing none, we will um, move on from Article 29 to Article 30, which is zoning bylaw amendment uh, related to gross floor area. Erin, I'll turn it back over to you. Uh, so this amendment um, includes language in section 5322 um, and in the definitions of open space, um, landscaped open space and usable open space that um, explicitly explain um, how to calculate both of those um, those required areas, um, which is off of the gross floor area, not the lot size. Thank you. Uh, Ken, any questions? No, this is more or less a uh, correction, isn't it? Yes, I would say it sort of falls into that category, um, but it does require um, inserting language in a couple of locations. Yep, I'm all fine, I'm fine. Thanks, Ken. Jean? Why don't you go to David first, because I just thought of something and I want to look something up. Sure, David. Just wanted to clarify, this was something that uh, that was lost during the bylaw recodification and we're bringing it back in. Is, is that correct, Darren? Um, yes, I believe that in the prior, the pre-recodified bylaw um, in the table of density and dimensional um, use uh, regulations, there was a note that it's based on the gross floor area. Yeah. Um, so uh, it just, it brings that back forward with a circular reference. So it's especially explicit. Yeah, I, I think just for the benefit of, of any members of the public uh, who are on, who may not uh, have been following the um, zoning bylaw recodification that happened now a few years ago, uh, which was a complete major recodification of the zoning bylaw, um, we, we have found a number of, of items where in, in the course of doing such a major reorganization, we have um, um, inadvertently left out um, pieces here and there and um, things like this. And I think maybe some of the other ones that we'll discuss later uh, would fall into that category. Um, so this is, is basically cleaning, cleaning up uh, after a very complex process that we went through. Great, thanks, David. Jean, did you find what you were looking for? Yeah, I did. And I mean, yeah, David's got it right. This is just clarifying because it was a little bit unclear about what one used to calculate usable open space and landscape open space. So this just clarifies what it is. It's fine. Yeah, it's needed and it's exactly what is needed. Great, thank you. Melissa? Okay, Ken? Yeah, I, I sure look back at my notes. There's one thing I do question. Uh, under uh, 5.3.22, uh, 5 gross floor area. Yep, right there. Ele elevator shafts and stairwells on each floor. Um, I thought, we had talked before that the elevator shafts and stairwells were, were to be counted on the ground floor only because they're, they're a vertical hole all the way up. Um, I'm, I, uh, I'm not familiar with that conversation. Maybe Jenny can jump in. So this, the, is, that's this, nothing, this is in the existing bylaw. We're not adding this text. The only thing that's being added is right here. So okay. that, that's, that's already existing in the zoning bylaw right now, Ken. Okay. All right. Okay. Somehow my notes somehow say saying that I thought we talked about the last time we did the codification. Did we not no. talk about that? No, uh, not not in my not. I do not recall that. No. Okay. Sorry. Never mind. Um, but it, but this language right here very important to note for anybody following along. This is not. We're not adding something new about gross floor area. The parts that are new are underlined throughout this document. Anything that's underlined is new and anything that we're striking is obviously crossed out. Um, but everything else is existing text in the existing zoning bylaw. Thank you. Great, thank you for the clarification, Jenny. Uh, any other comments before we open it up for public questions and comments? 
Okay, any member of the public uh, wishing to speak or comment on this article, please raise your hand. I see one person. Please remember that you will have three minutes to address this article and uh, please remember to identify yourself by your first, last name and address. Uh, uh, John Warden. He's, he's still muted. Uh, oh, I've, I sorry. asked him to mute, unmute. Yep, if you could unmute, please. Thank you. How's that? Is that better? That much better. Thank you. All right. Now start me. Start your clock over again, please. No, I, I sure will. I, I I probably want to not take three minutes. Um, no, <clears throat> I just want to say, with respect to the things left out in the recodification, uh, I participated in that process, and and one of the things that I I urged and pleaded for uh, without success is that you do what we did when, when a volunteer committee uh, of this town uh, recodified the town bylaws and that is the cross-reference table in which you take each section of the old bylaw and show where it is in the new bylaw. And that gives you a cross check to be sure you got everything. Now the board and, and the recodification people declined to do that they did a sort of reverse one, which was not at all helpful. Um, well, it was a little bit helpful, but not very. And had that been done, you know, we can't go back and, and uh, fix past mistakes. If that been done, things like this and whatever other things are still lurking out there that were missed uh, would not have happened. So it, it proves the necessity of getting competent people to do this recodification business. And, and having that cross-reference table, I think is, valuable because that way you don't you don't lose things thank you thank you uh any other questions on this before we move on to the next article okay uh the next article is article 31 uh zoning bylaw amendment related to prohibited uses and i'll turn this over to aaron Thank you. Um, so this was a suggestion that came in to include um, something explicit in the bylaw that um, indicated that uh, uses without a Y as a yes, this use is allowed or an SP, a special permit is required, um, should be noted as a prohibited use. Um, in addition to what is stated in the memo, I'd also like to point out that this is similar to um, uh, some comments that we heard on Mr. Loretti's um, article earlier this evening. Um, and this, this may in fact have the same intended or the same, um, the same effect or outcome as Mr. Loretti's um, article, um, although a little bit more expansive. Great, thank you, Aaron. Uh, Ken? No, no comments. Okay, uh, David? No comments. Jean? I mean, I think it was understood that if it didn't have a Y or an SP, then you couldn't do it. So it just, in a sense, makes it clear that that's what it was. Great. Uh, Melissa? No comment. Great. Thank you. Uh, so we will open this up to the public for any questions or comments. Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the next article, which is Article 32, the Zoning Bylaw Amendment for Other Districts, Dimensional and Density Regulations. Erin. Uh, uh, so the um, tables of density and dimensional regulations are split up between the residential districts, the business districts, and then all the other districts. Um, this legend appears in the section um, before uh, the table of density and dimensional regulations for residential districts and business districts, but is missing um, for the third group of districts, which are the other districts. Um, so this amendment uh, just uh, pastes that same exact legend into that section um, for consistency's sake. Great, thank you. Uh, Ken, any questions? No. Nope. Jean? No. David? No. Melissa? 
Nope. Okay. I'll open up to the public. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, we will move into uh, Article 33, which is which are the administrative amendments uh, uh, for the zoning bylaws. Erin? Thank you. Um, so this is uh, five um, separate amendments all built into one um, that we've turned, termed administrative amendments. Um, there are, uh, as part of this, we are updating references from the Board of Selectmen to the Select Board removing gendered terms in the zoning bylaw um, and using um, gender neutral terms, um, updating a section reference, um, inserting a date and making a cross reference update consistent with an article that was passed at, at the 2019 annual town meeting that um, defined um, the, uh, the ad um, attic space that counts towards gross floor area um, it had been seven feet, three inches, that article that passed in 2019 um, brought it down to seven feet, which um, if I am remembering correctly, is consistent with um, building code. Um, this was um, inadvertently forgotten during that, that um, town meeting. Thank you, Erin. Uh, Ken, any questions? No. Jean? No, thank you. David? No questions. Melissa? No, no questions. Thanks. Great. And I do not have any questions either. Uh, we'll open it up to uh, members of the public for any questions or comments. Okay. Seeing none, uh, that brings us to the end of our uh, zoning article, uh, our Warren articles that we are reviewing uh, this evening. Um, Jean? Just a quick thing, should we just take a vote to close public? It's the next thing on my list to do. Sorry. Absolutely. Nope, no problem. Uh, so any other any other questions uh, from the from the board before we move on to uh, taking a motion to close the public hearing? I move. So move. Okay. Second. Okay. So and I just want to be clear, the motion actually needs to be to continue the open public hearing to the next scheduled date which is Monday, March 15th. So if we could remove, that would be appreciated. I should have stated it before we got into the- Well, into the, is it to continue it, but also to close it on the articles that we've just reviewed? Uh, cor I believe that we don't actually close them on these articles. We no. keep them open. Mm -hmm. you, members of the public can still speak to these articles while the- hearings are open in general. Okay. Well, I'll withdraw my motion and put in the new motion to continue this to the next day. Great, thank you. I'll second that. Thank you, any discussion? All right, I'll take a roll call vote. Uh, Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am yes as well. So the uh, open public hearing is, uh, is uh, continued to Monday, March 15th. All right, so now we will move back uh, to the earlier items in our agenda. Um, thank you everyone for allowing us to move through that section so quickly. And thank you, um, Mr. Inessi for sticking with us uh, through that portion. Um, we will reopen docket number 3638 400 to 402 Massachusetts Avenue, a continued public hearing. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm accompanied by Cynthia Pascuto, one of the principals and Ken File, uh, the architect. I'm not going to get into uh, a long uh, position with respect to the background. You've all heard it uh, at this point. What I did do is I submitted a memo. And in that memo, I uh, basically indicated that both myself and my client were under the impression, perhaps not with all of you, but uh, that there might be a sentiment if, that, uh, if we came back with three residential units rather than four, that there might be an accompanying more welcoming uh, position on the part of the members of the ARB with respect to our proposal. Now we have made some changes to the plan, can, get, uh, can go through those. I've outlined those uh, in uh, my memo uh, to you folks. 
uh, and I'll let Ken talk about those. Uh, we did also discuss, uh, of course, the last time, uh, the building itself and whether plans uh, had ever surfaced with regard to uh, what happened after the fire in, uh, in or about 1980. I indicated that we were not able to locate any plans. Uh, in any event, uh, I brought to the attention of the board uh, Chapter 40A, Section 7, which uh, indicates that uh, if the building was constructed uh, as it was in 1980, after that Zoning Board of Appeals decision, uh, and uh, the uh, building department did not come along uh, within uh, uh, 10 years of the date the building was constructed, uh, then uh, the, uh, the building inspector could not enforce any violations which may have occurred. And I, can, I indicated in my memo that I did not concede that any violations had occurred. Uh, the result of chapter 40A section seven uh, is that the property becomes legally, not just non-conforming, non-conforming, but legally non-conforming uh, because there's nothing that can be done to basically disturb the property. It's now protected under chapter 40A section seven. So with that, uh, Ken, why don't you jump in and explain the changes on the plan? Ken? Hello? He might be muted. Ken, are you there? Well, uh, I, I can talk about the changes on the plan. Uh, the revised plans, uh, and based on my memo, show the first level of the building will contain an office unit on the right-hand side of the building fronting on Mass Ave and a residential unit on the left-hand side. That's a change from the original plan. The second level will contain two residential units. Each of the units are going to be one bedroom units. We're not looking for any more than one bedroom units. The bicycle storage area will be located on the first floor rather than in the basement. And that's a change from the original plan. We're now walking up, uh, Mr. Watkins, rather than walking down uh, with respect to the interior bicycle uh, 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 storage. We'll also have bicycle storage on the exterior of the building as well. We are still going to provide an electric motor, motor vehicle charging station uh, on the plans and that's shown on the plans. Uh, Jenny, if you can show us that uh, uh, on the plans, that's shown on the plans. And uh, we also show a covered trash enclosure as well. So uh, I also made the argument to the board that with respect to some of the uh, uh, items we're proposing to the board, such as the bicycle parking, the electrical charging station, if the matter goes back to the Zoning Board of Appeal, and if it does, we would still have, we would have three office units and two residential units. They can't take that away from us. We have that. That's fixed in concrete, okay? What I'm suggesting is that this is an opportunity for the ARB to acquire jurisdiction of this property, because right now, uh, the jurisdiction would reside with the Zoning Board of Appeal. I'm suggesting that now is the opportunity for the ARB to take its jurisdiction back because the property fronts on Mass Ave. This is a logical site for jurisdiction to reside with the ARB. So I'm suggesting to the board, if the matter goes back to the ARB, uh, to the Zoning Board, we would not have an obligation to provide bicycle parking. We would not have an obligation to provide an electrical charging station. So I'm suggesting to the members of the board that it makes eminent good sense for the interest of the town and for the interest of the site itself to have the ARB be the authority that basically oversees what happens as far as the property is concerned. So we're asking that the board approve the plans for three residential units, not four, three, uh, and uh, three off, uh, and two office units. Thank you, Mr. Anessi. 
Uh, I will ask any other any other comments, Mr. Nessie, or are you all? Uh, no, I do not. Ken, are you okay. around? Ken, I guess you've gone. Okay, all great. Right. So, um, Ken, we'll we'll start with you, um, and if you could just identify um, whether you were able to view the the video um, of the uh, of the public hearing from last week. Uh, yes, I was. I like to uh, Paula apologize. The uh, personal issue came up, and I could not make the meeting. I apologize for that. Uh, but I was able to um, listen to last week's um, uh, meeting and. Um, my opinion on this is that I, I'm in favor of granting this uh, um, request for three units of apartments and two office spaces. Um, I, I think what I'm trying to say is I like to keep on continuing encouraging uh, maintaining upkeep of this building since this is right on Mass Ave and it's a historic building. It's gonna be there uh, for everybody to see. I don't want this, um, uh, let, to let the economics of this building uh, weigh by because of we can't get the rent and we can't get the occupancy that they're not gonna put any money into upkeep of the building or maintaining anything here. So um, I'm, I think I'm leading toward the favor of uh, granting this relief. Um, I think having two office spaces on the, uh, on the first floor is still maintaining what we're trying to do here. We're just talking about one added apartment building and that's down the basement. Is that correct, Robert? That is correct, Mr. Uh, Ken. No, I'm, no, I'm sorry. Hi, it's Cynthia. That is incorrect. Um, the residential unit would be on the first floor across from the commercial unit. Uh, the reason being that um, tenants um, do not like when there is a business above them because that business could be there um, you know, during when they're sleeping. And so that is why the basement would remain the office unit and the first floor would be the residential. I'm sorry about the interruption. That, that's correct, that's correct. Is that the way it's shown on the drawings, I, or did I misread that? It should be on the second the second sheet. This is Ken File, uh, partner at uh, LYF Architects. That's just the existing. If we go to the uh, the second, there we go. That's the, this is the uh, proposed uh, floor plan where the uh, apartment would be on the the first floor with the new bike storage. I see, and then the. And and, and the, the basement, the basement remains, would have the existing the existing office space that exists currently today. Okay, so that would not change. That is correct. That is correct. All right, I, I see. I see. It it makes your argument a little weaker, um, but I can see that. I have no issues. Thank you, Ken. Jean. Yes, yeah, thank you for making um, these changes. I think um, that they now meet what I consider the minimum requirements by having three um, residential units and two um, office units. Um, I think we'll have to allow the bicycle parking up a few steps, which we have the authority to do because it's much better than the previous one, which was sort of down a set of um, winding stairs. I think though, and, and maybe somebody correct me, I think only five parking spaces are now required. And I think there was some discussion at one of the earlier meetings about removing one of the parking spaces and maybe putting in a little bit of green space. So I think um, somebody can count, but I think it's one um, space per each apartment unit and then one space for each office. So that would be five. So I'd say we had talked about having one. Oh, this one only has five. So you've done it already. Thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm okay. With, I think I'm okay with this. With, you know, we will have to 
okay, the few steps up and down for the bike storage, I think it's a much better place. The only thing that I would ask be added in the conditions is that the basement office unit be constructed and let out to rent no later than the first floor um, apartment unit because I wouldn't want the incentive to be, oh, we'll get to the um, office unit sometime in the distant future. So with that potential condition, I would be okay with the other conditions we discussed. Thank you, Jean. Uh, David. So just a question, is, is that condition necessary? I thought the basement office unit already exists and would be unchanged. That is, that is correct. The basement unit is existing as it is right now. As oh, no office. change. Huh? So um, that being said, uh, I appreciate uh, the work that you all have done to respond to our various comments uh, throughout this process. And um, while, uh, you know, I think it would have been nice uh, uh, to be able uh, to have uh, both of the first floor units remain commercial. Uh, I understand um, and don't disagree um, with, with the comments that the owner made. Um, and I, I think this uh, project as now proposed more reasonably falls within uh, the intention of the mixed use by law and I'm inclined to approve it in this form. Thank you, David. Um, I also uh, agree, uh, you know, while I wish the two offices were in this, in the, uh, on the first floor, I understand the decision that was made, uh, but I appreciate the, um, the, uh, the changes that were made in this, this last round of revisions um, and also feel much more comfortable with this. Um, and Melissa, um, because you have, were not with us for the beginning, unfortunately, uh, uh, we'll have to ask you to recuse, recuse yourself from this um, from this discussion. Okay. Any other questions uh, or comments from the board before we open this up for public comment? Okay. Uh, any members of the public wishing to speak on this uh, on this item, please use the raise hand function, and uh, I will call on you. You will have three minutes to speak. Don Seltzer. Oh, I, one other, please uh, remember to introduce yourself by your first, last name, and address. Sure. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Um, I'd like to say it's good to see that this project has been scaled back to three apartments because that's a use that is allowed in B1 districts. Last week, the applicant was very concerned that they could not make money with this arrangement. I want to reassure them that with the, some numbers provided to this board by their own attorney, that it is very much uh, possible. Last October, Mr. Anessi was representing a similar project in a B1 district in the Heights. And he told the board that small office space was very viable in Arlington. He had consulted with realtor Bob Bowes and was confident that 475 square feet uh, of space could rent for about $1,000 per month. Using an even more conservative rent figure that is on the low end of the range for Arlington, the applicant can be reasonably expect to rent his two office spaces for about $3,100 per month combined. The three apartments should bring in at least $5,800 per month. So the total expected revenue for the building is nearly $9,000 per month. On the expense side, the taxes on this property are $1,123 per month. The mortgage, well, that was paid off 25 years ago in 1995. There are, of course, other expenses, but the gap between revenue of 9,000 per month and taxes of 1,100 should be able to cover those costs, I would think. Um, one other note, if the board decides to approve it, I would suggest that in the conditions, um, all three 
apartment units be required to get certificates of occupancy since uh, none of them have it at this point. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker will be uh, Aram Holman. Test, yes. We can hear you, yes. Okay. Uh, Aram Holman, 12 Whittemore Street. I live nearby and so I am concerned about this. I have two questions. I, may I ask them as questions? Uh, sure, I can certainly direct them to the applicant uh, if, if it makes sense to do so. Sure, when I looked at the plans this summer um, on the upper stories, they were declaring uh, what, appear, what would otherwise be bedrooms as studies. Are they still calling these offices or studies rather than bedrooms in order to reduce the tax law, property tax liability? So we addressed that, um, Mr. Holman, uh, last last week. We are not looking at the assessing records. Uh, Attorney Anessi, I will turn it over to you, but I believe that these are uh, opposite, they're, they're labeled as offices in your- they're, As they're labeled on the plan is what they are, okay? And that's all Thank I'm you. going to say about that. Thank you. Mr. Holman, you said you had a second question? Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll see if I can declare one of my bedrooms as an office too. Uh, the other question I have is about parking, and this is of more uh, was concerned earlier. How are people? How are unrelated parties going to coordinate the movements of their cars? And this was brought into the forefront of my awareness because on my street, Whittemore Street, right nearby, we have a politically wired landlord who was asking that her tenants be exempted from the four hour parking rule that applies to Whittemore Street. And her complaint is that as you see here, there is a, a driveway with three cars parked tandem. And her complaint is that her own tenants have trouble coordinating. Therefore they keep their cars on the street, which the neighbors don't like and to which they get tickets. So she's asking for an exemption for them. Uh, Town Manager Chapdelaine in a meeting of the Parking Advisory Committee was concerned that such a request would set precedent. So my question is, if that is approved on my street, what is, what is the ARB going to do or what will the select board do when tenants of this building ask for similar comparable parking relief? Notice that this is on Avon Place, which like my street, Whittemore Street, dead ends at the bike path. There is very limited parking. It's a narrow street. Uh, how are you going to deal with their eventual requests for relief? Because you're gonna have unrelated people trying to coordinate their cars. Uh, Thank you. I, I think we understand the, the, the question. So uh, this was addressed early on and attorney Anessi, I will turn it over to you because I, I know that the um, the uh, owner had had addressed the tandem parking situation. with yes, We've never had issues at the property with respect to that matter. OK, uh, what you're talking about is pure speculation at this point. We are going to coordinate parking at the site. Uh, we've had no complaints from tenants uh, over the years with respect to parking at our property. I don't know about your street because I have no information about your street. All I can talk about is our property. And that's what I'm saying about our property. Thank you, Mr. Anessi. Uh, uh, any other questions, you. Mr. Holman? Uh, th thank you. I would again ask you to be concerned with that, lest the residents of Avon Place have to deal with the same situation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public uh, wishing to ask questions or uh, speak on this topic? Okay, seeing none, I will close public comment uh, for 400 to 402 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, any additional questions or commentary from the board before we move to a vote? Jean? I just wanted to say in response to what Mr. Holman said, we did raise those issues. And if this was a new site, 
it would be different, but they've had tandem parking there for years with the same number of units. And that went into the decision making. Thank you for the clarification, Jean. Any other uh, questions or comments from the board? Okay, uh, do we have a uh, motion to uh, approve this uh, application as uh, amended for to uh, uh, the March 1st uh, hearing? So motion. Second. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Although in, those in favor, please say aye. Uh, Ken? Yes. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Congratulations. Uh, this has been approved. Thank you all. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And thank you Good for evening. sticking with us this evening. No problem. All right, that closes uh, docket 3638, 400 to 402 Massachusetts Avenue. And we'll now move back to uh, agenda item number two, which was an update on special permits issued by the Redevelopment Board from 2016 to 2020. And uh, Jenny or Aaron, I'm not sure which one of you um, was going to take us through this. It's me. Um, Great, and you, Jenny. Yes, you're welcome. Also, thank you to Aaron, um, <laughs> always. But I, um, this of course was in response to Ken's request to take a look at uh, what has been permitted by the redevelopment board and sort of, he asked actually for just, I think three years, but I went back five. Um, so I looked at 2016 through basically all of last year. And um, you know, what, I, what I'll say about it is that you can see the, the, of any of the most significant development, it came out of the mixed use zoning bylaw um, the anything that has an asterisk next to it is uh, something that was permitted as a mixed use development. Um, and you can see that over the years here, uh, what that looked like beginning in 2016. Um, and then the, the second larger um, types of developments had to do with the Housing Corporation of Arlington. One of those, of course, was a mixed use development. And the other one is the Downing Square development at 19R Park Ave. But um, predominantly what the board seems to mostly review um, given its authority, um, which is different than other planning boards. It, that's important to note. Other planning boards deal with uh, sometimes, uh, you know, uh, larger scale uh, residential projects, for example, um, and uh, larger scale commercial development sometimes. But uh, the board seems to uh, do a lot of signage review over the years, um, even still, uh, though we did amend the, the signage bylaw and hoped to make that a little bit more streamlined, you do still end up reviewing a lot of signage because of the, the types of changes that are made or changes to a non-conforming sign. So, um, you know, there are many reasons for that, but, um, but, but predominantly, I think what I wanted to point out was that the, the real thrust of development for the last five years has been due to the mixed use zoning bylaw. So that's just, something important to keep in mind as we head into this coming town meeting and we have a um, couple of you know a lot of conversation around mixed use the types of uh, proposals that we're seeing in relationship to mixed use um, it's important to just note that 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 does weigh quite heavily on what we're seeing and then I think the the bigger question is why do we not see any other type of development um, what what is missing and why um, and I, I think, you know, that's clearly a, a much broader conversation, but it does kind of go back to conversations about what types of development we want to see along the Massachusetts Avenue and the Broadway corridors, for example, um, as well as along, you know, other in other locations like the Millbrook corridor, the Minuteman bikeway, etc. Those are areas that typically when there's new development that's being proposed, it will come to the board given its purview. Um, but we aren't really seeing a lot of that type of development. And I think it's important to ask why. Um, the industrial use uh, proposal that we have that'll be a future public hearing will somewhat aim to address some of this issue, uh, which is something that came out of the economic analysis of industrial zoning districts. Um, but I do think that it's worth, you know, talking about the, uh, any of this a little bit further. I, I know that Ken might have some specific questions since he asked 
for this to be brought to the board. But I just wanted to provide that summary for all of you. And I'm glad to answer any questions also about just, I know that this, this is rather simplistic, but I'm, I'm glad to dig into any one of them if there are questions. So with that, maybe just Ken, do you have, were there any other specific items that you wanted me to review? Well, I just wanna say thank you for putting this together, Jenny. This is very helpful. Um, I do wanna ask a couple of questions. Um, since I don't, this right here, um, you know that daycare center that we approved the expansion? Is yes. it listed here? It is, it was the 93 Broadway, it was last year, the school edition. Okay. Is that happening? I, I don't see anything happening there. I requested an update, but my understanding is that the, you know, due to the pandemic, there have been some changes with what they, you know, the, how much they've been able to uh, use, utilize the school. And then th that has an impact also on their financial planning potentially for anything else at this particular time. It doesn't mean that they've decided to not do something, but you know, that the plan is currently on hold that, that doesn't, that doesn't mean anything necessarily. It was only approved in 2020. And I think, um, you know, to the point about how long a special permit is effective, it's it's a, it's good for three years. So they do have time, but I will uh, continue to find out if I can get any sort of update and of course report back to the board should something be different. Uh, okay, and then my uh, follow-up to that is, uh, what about the animal hospital? On Broadway. The animal hospital, yeah. I, I think that they just have simply scaled back what they've been able to do right now, but they do have an intention to do more at a later date. That also is a, um, a business where I think, you know, they, they wanted to take their time with that um, renovation project. And so, you know, it's, it's an approved project and I know that they intend to follow through with it, but they're, they're taking it in phases. Okay. Uh, are there any other projects that we have approved that's sort of on this hi hiatus that, uh, that I'm just not thinking of on top of my head? Um, no, although there are some things that we've approved that either have since closed, the business closed, or the business never opened. Okay, yeah, I remember the lobster shop, yes. Yes, the, um, that was 478 Mass Ave. Okay. Um, there was also the uh, 30 to 50 Mill Street kiosk um, was permitted, but did not proceed. Get the ice cream um, and yeah. then there was unfortunately uh, 190 to 192 Mass Ave Adventure Pub uh, has since closed. Um, what about the uh, restaurant on the Heights? That is in progress um, and they're, you know, they have a building permit and my understanding is they're, they're working on the fit out under construction. Okay. There was some chatter uh, on, uh, I forget if it was the Arlington email list or Facebook group, but uh, that there was some activity in that space recently. Yep. They have Good. a building they're permit. They're actively working yep. on it. Good. I'm, I'm, I'm just really, you know, the way I feel is that somehow we don't have that many projects being done here in Arlington. And, um, you, you, hit, you know, you, you're 100% you're correct, Jenny. I mean, we, what are we not doing as the development authority to help encourage this? And looking back is a way of sort of trying to understand it. That's what I was trying to do. And um, maybe we can have an, another form of sit down, you know, with maybe some uh, public uh, uh, involvement saying, hey, what can we do to encourage? Because everybody says they want uh, more commercial space, but you know, just because you want it, it ain't going to happen. You have to somehow encourage it to make it happen. Or if you want more retail, or we want a more lively street, we got to do something to make that happen. And um, I just want to spend a little more time on looking at ways to do that. Um, and maybe after uh, town meeting and all the zoning stuff, we can set a few meetings aside or if we can start a workshop group and to think about that, I, I would like to do that. I don't know what the rest of the board members think about that and what their opinion is. One, one thing that occurs to me is we've, we've talked a little bit before about wanting 
to um, look at developing commercial design guidelines. Um, and possibly, you know, if, if we were more explicit about exactly what we would like to see developed, that might uh, take away some of the uncertainty that a developer might feel, you know, looking at opportunities in, in Arlington if, if they have a better sense of what we're looking for. Yeah, I agree with you, David. I think that's a possibility. Um, you could also turn the other way around and say, look, let's um, see what this uh, developers want to look for when they want to develop the commercial space and see if we, we can address any of those issues. Yeah, I, I don't think we should develop any design guidelines in a vacuum. I, I think, you know, I, I would hope that we'd get some participation from developers as well as other members of the public in, in trying to come to some kind of uh, consensus. Let me ask a, qu a clarifying question. Um, so we have design standards for commercial and industrial areas that was adopted by the board in uh, 2015 actually. So um, can, you, can you express how or explain how that would be different what you're proposing, David, just so I can understand what you mean? I, I think um, certainly um, a num some members of the public have expressed concerns about the, um, the look uh, of, of some of the projects that have been developed in recent years. And um, I, I, was, um, I was thinking that if we could provide perhaps more guidance specifically about, about uh, design elements. Um, if, we could, if we could, through a process, come to some sort of consensus as to what we would like, most like to see in town, that that could be, uh, that could enhance the existing guidelines. Can I just add on to that a little bit? I, we talked a little bit about this at our goal setting meeting in, yes. in December. And I, I think one of the challenges um, to, I think also what gets to some of Ken's points there is that um, the number of meetings and the amount of space that we, or the amount of work that we have to ask some of the developers to do to get to a building typology that is approvable could be lessened if there was a more explicit guideline for, to David's point, um, building elements, materiality, massing, those types of things. Um, there, there seems to be quite a ways to, to go sometimes um, in terms of where what we get as the first entry point um, that that could be that could lessen the amount of time that they times that they have to come back to the redevelopment board if we had something that was more explicit in the way that the residential design guideline is. Thank you. That Any was other? much more articulate than what I was trying to explain. Thank you. I deal with design guidelines on the regular. So, <laughs> um, any any other uh, comments related to this or or thoughts, Jean? Yeah, just I I um, wondered about where the former Atwood House is and its process of going through the demolition bylaw, et cetera. Sure. Um, my understanding is that they have tried to get a demolition permit with a few different contractors and are now on their fourth contractor um, who is working to get a demo permit. Once they pull the demolition permit, it goes to the Arlington Historical Commission um, to then go through a delay process, essentially. It'll then trigger the demo delay by law. Um, so, we, so we won't see them for more than a year. No, yeah, correct. Thank you. You're welcome. Bless you. Excuse me, thank you, I thought I hit mute. <laughs> <laughs> 
any other any other um, questions or or comments? Can I I agree with you? I think that you know perhaps circling back to this once we get through town meeting um, with some other ideas. We had some good meeting or good ideas too at the goal setting session that are written into you know looking at you know whether it's the business district in the Heights or taking taking certain business districts and looking at opportunities for encouraging more robust development that perhaps we could circle back to. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. You're welcome. So we'll put it on a future agenda. Great, thank you. Yeah. All right, so that closes agenda item number two. So we'll now move ahead to agenda item number four, which is the review of the MOU um, related to 23 Maple Street. So this is an item that actually has no item. Um, I had hoped that I was going to have material to provide to the board on Friday um, at a minimum, but I did not receive it from the legal department, unfortunately. They're still working on an aspect that's sort of important to the MOU, which relates to the Verizon lot. Um, and parking for vehicles, uh, particularly for staff. They want to use the parking that is right adjacent to Maple, 23 Maple Street just for visitors so that we don't have people coming and parking on Maple Street itself. So in order to do that, it's gonna take a little bit more time is my understanding. I'm hoping that I can definitely be back on the 15th with something. So I put it on the agenda with the hope that it was going to move forward, but that's, that's all I have for now. We are still working on a lot of details related to what we need to do at the property to get them moved in, just so you know, but um, but in terms of the MOU, that's where it stands. Great, thank you, Jenny. You're welcome. All right, uh, so we will now move to agenda item number five, which is uh, open forum. Uh, so this is an opportunity for any member of the public wishing to address the board uh, to have the opportunity to speak. If you would like to speak, please use the raise hand function and I will call on you in the order that the uh, hands are raised. Okay, uh, first speaker will be Steve Revelek and I'll remind everybody that you will have three minutes. Please identify yourself by your first, last name and address. Hello, uh, Steve Revelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. I have a question for the architects on the board if you're willing to humor it. Um, for a long time, brick was a very common exterior material for, you know, uh, apartment buildings, for commercial buildings and, and that sort of thing. And over the past few years, it seems that um, fiber panel boards, various cementitious boards are more the material of choice. And I was just wondering, in your experience, what was the motivation behind that shift? Uh, I, I can I can start and Ken, I'm sure you can uh, chime in too from your experience. I think cost, mm -hmm. <laughs> timing, um, you know, both that as well as, um, you know, just in terms of what aesthetic is is desired by uh, the end user. Those are those are really the three, the three big, um, the three big shifts that that I've seen impact those those types of material choices. Ken? I totally agree. It's, it's, let's say 90% cost and 10% um, loss um, trade professions. Mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to find a good mason or a good mason company nowadays. Um, just, they just don't exist anymore. They just, that's a lost um, profession. Okay. Yeah. I was, my own thoughts was that, you know, it does take a while to assemble a wall in little two inch by four inch by eight pieces. <laughs> so thank, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for sharing that. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be Don Seltzer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. Uh, just two short items. Um, one is um, during the first agenda item for 10 Sunnyside, one of the members of the public who got cut off and was not allowed to speak earlier, uh, I noticed was a member of the Disabilities Commission. And I believe she had some important comments to be made about um, lack of ADA um, accessibility 
in the unit that was proposed, particularly in the parking and maybe um, in some other aspects of the building itself. Um, all those apartments are required to be um, group one under Massachusetts uh, 521 CMR. So that's something that should probably bring up at the next meeting and make sure that there is um, proper ADA compliance. The other item was just now when you were going over the list of projects, uh, that was the really big one is that you happen to skip over is 1207 Mass Ave. And I've noticed that the sale has not been completed yet. The town still owns it. They haven't received any money for the sale. And the purchase and sale agreement did specify that it was required that the sale be closed within 30 days of the special permit being issued. So the, in fact, the developer was here until just a few minutes ago and he left. I had hoped at that time that maybe he could be asked to give a status update as to how he's progressing on this project. Uh, perhaps Jenny knows something more. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Don. So uh, for anyone who was not uh, able to speak, unfortunately, we did have to open the, um, the warrant ar article public hearing as advertised. We did remind everybody that they were more than welcome and in fact encouraged to submit any comments uh, written uh, to, to Jenny who would pass those on to, to the board. Um, and of course we do hope that they would join us at a, at a future, um, at the future hearing date, which is the 15th. Uh, any other members of the public? Uh, Aram Holman. Um, I'm not going to get an answer about the from Jenny about the I, hotel. Oh, I don't have I, an answer for you, Jenny. I don't. I don't know if you have any update. I do not have an update. Thank you, uh, Aaron Holman. Aaron Holman, twelve Whittemore Street. Uh, I've been attending these meetings for a while, and. I guess I'll follow what's uh, Steve Revelak's lead in simply asking a question more about how the board proceeds. Uh, I have my own concerns. They typically deal with density, affordable affordability of housing, uh, and larger social issues. And I'd appreciate any insight from any members of the board as to how you balance considerations of those against strictly regulatory uh, requirements and uh, architectural design issues. Uh, my question is a bit open-ended, uh, however you, any of you would like to answer it. Uh, would anyone like to, to speak to that? I'd be, I'd be happy to, but I'd also be happy to defer if Jean or Ken or David or Melissa, I know you're just joining us, <laughs> which two? wish to uh to start us off i can tell uh, mm -hmm. where i start and where it ends and that is you know we're required to apply the environmental design guidelines and to do what basically they tell us to do within them there are opportunities to look at some of the things that you're talking about and if you attended lots of our hearings, you see that we have um, given pushback to applicants when they first come in on things that we think are not, you know, within the spirit or letter of those guidelines and the review criteria. And at least for me, you know, that's what one of our major roles is to not, you know, go outside our lane and our lane is that. Okay, well, thank you. I'll just add too that I think that um, really looking at the the goals of the master plan of the town, um, which incorporate many of the um, many of the topics that, that you just brought up, are are also um, front and center when we consider a lot of these developments in terms of what the the uses are that the town has identified are um, important to the to the town. Thank you. Great. Thank I'll, you. Very I'll much just add one more thing. Please go ahead, David. Um, and I agree with both 
uh, Rachel and, and Jean. But I, I think if you, if you look at how we've approached various projects over the years, um, what we focus on uh, within our review of both the environmental design standards and uh, the context in which we're making the decision uh, varies from project to project. And, and sometimes we're more focused on, on some aspects and uh, other times we're focused on other aspects and it really depends on, on the context of the project. Um, so I, I think that's, that's where our, our discretion largely comes into it um, uh, while staying within the spirit of the environmental design standards. Again, thank you. And I'll, I'll just add that if you look at those standards, Aaron, they're pretty broadly written, so we can't do everything. Um, certainly not everything I would like to do in some circumstances, but it allows us to consider a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions or comments uh, from any member of the public wishing to speak this evening? Seeing none, we will close public comment. Uh, any other items from um, either Jenny or Aaron or members of the board before we take a motion to adjourn? Nothing further from me. Okay, great. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn, please. Second. Any discussion? All right, I'll go through roll call. Uh, Ken? Yes. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. Melissa? Yes. And I am a yes as well. Thank you, everyone. That closes our meeting for this evening. Have a good and night. Welcome, welcome, Melissa. You got a little yes. bit of everything for your first That's meeting. That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, nothing like uh, kicking it off with the uh, town meeting articles. That's great. Um, so, but, <laughs> thanks. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, Rachel gave me like some time on the phone. Jenny kind of prepped me too. So thanks, guys, in advance for that. And um, looking forward to working with all of you. Great. Thank you. Have a good night, Bye. everyone. Bye. Good night, everybody.